simulate like all that information I have to sink in. Like that I remember the first time I played a game, I did not understand everything that was happening in the game. Now I understand better and if you don't pay attention like to, to the game it could be a, a real real headache how the storyline goes like how the 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 timeline how it's been a, a mingle but right now uh yeah i'm gonna play uh four hours of uh four two eight chibuya scramble and then i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it's gonna be uh over for this week uh, I'm gonna show my, um, my my next week's schedule on the Discord very very soon. But for now, we're gonna jump on the 12 hour mark. I just realized, looking at the trophies, that uh, the game suggests that all the events are gonna have are gonna happen until 8 p.m. tonight. Like this is like the big deadline. But apparently. Um, the big deadline for everyone is 6 p.m. So there's gonna be five more chapters. The last chapter will be the 5 to 6 p.m. mark. So the story ends for everyone at 6 p.m. on this day. So. I decided we're gonna start with uh, the mascot just for for do something completely different. So let's jump on see Tama how she's doing. Ah, she's so cute. In one hour, the burning hammer cells demo will begin. Crunch. This is Shiri eating chips. Th those are more most likely uh, crackers. Um, uh, Chiri is laying out the assortment of snacks that we'll have on hand. Hey, Tama, are you hungry? Now we see the table, there's a lot of chips, popcorns, candies. Uh, she brought a ton of snacks. There's even lollipops, candies, cakes, peanuts. She brought a lot of stuff. Why, yes I am! I mean, that should be pretty obvious at this point. All I had since putting on this stupid mascot costume is some burning hammer and a bunch of iced tea. Hey now, she restarts, shoots back. What's with the attitude? Chiri, you do remember that you ate my lunch, right? The sticker said it was best before noon. You just made that up! <laughs> yeah. Cheery chortles merrily and chugged some more iced tea. <clears throat> okay, folks. Mr. Yanagishita calls out as he slips into the room. Launch break is over. Back to work. I don't feel like I've had so much of a break. If anything, I'm even more mentally exhausted than I was before. There's a box full of Anagochi toys in the storeroom on the third floor. Mind bringing those down? Anagochi? I ask. What's that? The name makes it sound like some sort of product knockoff. Like Tamagotchi. Anagochi. <laughs> Mr. Yanagishita's face went in widens in surprise. You've never heard of them? Oh yeah, it's uh... You know, Anagachi, it's a digital pet game where you raise an eel that lives in Tokyo Bay. So, it's... Alright, I got a blue letter for that. Anagachi, a portable electronic game which you raise a conger eel, or Anago, which is Anagachi. Um, since, um... Yeah, Tamagotchi is named after egg. Because we're the the eel, the pets are born from eggs, feeding it daily and clearing clean, clearing away feces, depending on how you raise your eel, it can wind up developing into various forms from normal eel to ultimate eel sushi. You can also use the infrared communication features to bring over friends for your eel for from another nearby Anagachi device. There is also a sister product, Trout Watch. 
<laughs> By connecting the two, you can view special events where the eel and trout character go to a pub together. What the fuck is that? Well, uh, I, I, I know that some Tamagotchi, uh, some fancy ones, had some infrared thing that you can, yeah, you can uh, make them play with each other. But <laughs> that's funny. Trout watch. Never heard of it, I say. Oh, uh, well, I guess maybe a lot of people in Japan haven't heard of it yet. But it's all the rage right now with youngsters over in NYC. NYC? Oh, it must mean New York City. It's popular in New York? Really? And anyway, I did some quick checking and that's what I learned. So last month I bought a whole bunch of them. And once again, you were swindled. Yep. Oh. And, oh, and once again, you were swindled. Yep. Ow, Chiri dropping the hard truth. <laughs> Mr. Yanagishita let a pathetic whimper. No! Those are tears. Oh my god. Those aren't tears. The guy cannot cry, and he puts some sort of gel. On his uh, on his face, so, so it would leak off his eyes. Cause uh, cries don't cry like that. Just like that, his confidence evaporates. He starts muttering to himself. I thought it sounded like a little fishy, really. I mean, think about it. Why would kids in New York be interested in raising eels from Tokyo Bay? He muses. And what a pill would a Neil character even have anyway? None, that's what. I should have known that. I did know it. Oh. Then why did you buy them? This farce is getting tiresome. Anyway. Yanagishita continues. It was going to cost way too much to keep them in storage, so I was going to just let the recycling guy take them. He hangs his hand in shame. In a matter of moments, he's, he's borderline catatonic. Shiri, on the other hand, flashes a big, bright grin. Still, you know, it was pretty delicious. Oh! Shiri! Yanagishita blurts. Thank you! He claps her hand in gratitude. Uh, I wasn't exactly complimenting you there, boss. It's the same thing. There's a little bit of me in each of my products. Anagachi and I are one and the same. And the brief Anagachi gameplay clip. The trick is to feed your eel proper food and give it proper exercise. Another important strategy tip is to make sure to obtain the sharp chef's knife when you visit Kapabachi Kitchen Town part way through the game. Now there's a menu food, food, grub, squid, and question mark. Squid. Grab. Worm. He's eating the worm. Cook. He's fine. Cook. The, the knife. Normal eel. Oh. You're cooking your pet. It's like uh, evolution. Like, you feed your eel, and when it's time to evolve, as in cook, it turns into like a normal eel or a sushi, uh, eel sushi roll. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, that's so silly. Which is to say, eels and I are one and the same. Go on then, say something nice about eels. Chiri chimes right in without missing a beat. Eels are awesome. When it comes to eel sushi, a hundred pieces barely whets my appetite. You know, these two make quite a pair. That really means a lot to me, Chiri. Thank you. Thank you. I don't understand what any of this is about, but if it helps man Mr. Yamagishika, Yanagishita's wounded spirit, I guess I can't complain. I leave them to their device and head for the storeroom. Little swig of my water canister. There you go. <clears throat> Don't 
The storeroom door opens with a rough grating sound. Okay, okay, so where's the light switch? I fumble around in the dark, feeling for the switch box. My custom paws mute the sensation in my hands enough that even finding that is difficult. I bat at the wall willy-nilly until eventually the light come on. Apparently I found the switch, even if I didn't feel it. Whoa, what the heck is this? The storeroom is practically overflowing with shoddy goods. A painting that looks like a child scribbling. An oddly shaped hat bearing the words grow two inches gray and teed. A cheap looking pendant with a tag that says it's set with a miracle stone. Miracle stone. These stones are nothing more than simple glass beads that were purchased at 5,000 yen a piece. The seller claimed normally these sells for 10,000 a pop, but if you buy 100 of them, it'll give you... I'll give you half off, at which the buyer declare, it really is a miracle, before joyfully agreeing to the purchase. The fact that someone like Yanagishita actually exists to buy these things up is also a kind of a miracle. <laughs> it's like, this is the knockoff boneyard where cheap produce goes to die. They break away from their pathetic herd, knowing their time has come and end up in this graveyard of a storeroom. Let's see, Anagachi, Anagachi. Oh, I quickly spy the cardboard box I'm looking for. Then I catch sight of a dark silhouette out of the corner of my eye. Eek! I yelp. Cockroach! It's one of them! Them. Black, flat, quick, long antenna, often spotted in kitchen. Sometimes, somehow, their legs wind up in restaurant food. Ew. The size, the speed, the dark shape, it couldn't be anything else. It peers back at me from the shadow of the Anagachi box, the faint light catching the luster of its carapace. It looks ready to leap out at me at any moment. I need to act fast. Hey, I challenge it to a single combat. I snatch up the cardboard box and make a run for it. <clears throat> Do you know what? I feel in the nice mood, I'm going to challenge the cockroach to single combat. For all we know, either it's going to be a funny skit or it's going to be a bad end. And we're going to see a mascot of a cat losing to a cockroach. <laughs> hey! I challenged it to single combat! It flitters aloft! Oh yeah! It's gunning for me, alright? Bracing myself, I step forward to confront it, which paradoxically up come my nerves. I get the sneaking suspicion that this is the first time I've done battle with one of these things. It's like I've trained myself to protect someone who's even more scared of them than I am. As I maul that over the thing hovering in the air, presses its attack against me. Not my chance! I snatch up a nearby piece of cardboard and swat at the creature hard. Yeah! It sails out the window in a graceful arc that flitters away in the world beyond. Phew, at least we parted on mutually acceptable terms. I didn't have to squash it or blast it with pesticide. Efting the box labeled Anagachi is scurried away from the graveyard of Schlock Mercedes. Schluck merchandise! <laughs> that was it. Okay. Phew, I made it! When I get back to the break room, Mr. Yanagishita is still clutching Shiri's hands. And it's super tasty when you salt broil it too. Thank you! But tempura style is probably the best. Thank you! Well... Mr. Yanagishita's spirit has certainly turned around! Okay, got it! I hold out the big cardboard box. Excellent! Thank you! You girls are the greatest! Yanagishita shouts. His voice is, resounds with gratitude. Hey, that's it! I just got an amazing idea! Why don't the three of us start our own company? I'll pass! Everybody makes X with their arms. Now, dame! 
Chewie and I, Chewie and I respond in unison. Pass, pass. Man, you two shot that one down quick. Well, for today, let's just focus on selling Burning Hammer. By the way, I ask, where is the Burning Hammer? There wasn't anything in the star room, and I don't see any here either. Oh, that's right. It's all uh, back in the loading dock. We should probably go bring it in. Oh, and bring the Anagachis with you, too. These recycling guys are going to be showing up soon. Come on, let's go! Shiri and I follow the Yanagishi tag out, Mr. Yanagishi tag out to the loading dock. Hmm. But the loading dock, it turns out, it's empty. Oh, I wonder what happened. Oh. There's no sign of the burning hammer everywhere. We, we they see uh, blinking boxes like they're supposed to be here, but they're not. It's... It's gone! Mr. Yanagashika murmurs. Then his voice was into a shot. It's gone! All gone! The burning hammer, it's all gone! Flying into a panic, he searched frantically from one end of the dock to the other, leaping into the air, even peering down into the cracks. But no matter where he looks, there's nothing for him to find! It was right there a little while ago, like right there, right there. I hear the sound of an engine revving outside. Oh, I see, yeah, the six boxes of burning hammer, uh, they're being packed into uh, um, the cargo of a truck. The backside of a... Um, Back side of the back side of the pickup. Uh, Mr. Yanagishita cries out in alarm. We can see a truck starting to pull away. <coughs> it's bad, is piled right with cardboard boxes and other sort of trash. Hey, boss, is that? Oh, sorry. Hey, boss, is that? Yes, there is! Mr. Yanagishita began racing after the truck. My burning hammer! His voice cracks as he cries out. Give that back! Give it back! But he's no match for a speeding truck and the boxes of Burning Hammer vanishes before his eyes. Burning Hammer! Come back! Come back! Now we see like a, a, a very overly dramatic scene. Like, like it's... Um, over exaggerated. Like a breakup. Yanagishita's wailing echoes from the surrounding buildings. It's like something out of a movie. Yeah, it's exactly something out of a movie. What the hell? What's up with that truck? Tama! Who the heck was that? Hey, don't look at me, I reply. Uh, with all those piles of stuff, it looked like his, that was the recycling guy. As soon as he said it, revelations onto his face. Oh, the recycling guy. He mutters. I can see the color drying from his face. The words recycling guy give me an idea. If it was him, maybe he thought he was picking up the Anagachis by Miss. We have to find it! We have to find that truck! The man is... The man is absolutely beside himself. Chiri, Tama, you two split up and try to track it down. Wait, why do we have to look for it? Again, Chiri and I speak in chorus. If there's no sell demo, there's no money to pay you. And then all the work you've done will be for nothing. Right, when he puts it that way, I guess there isn't much of a choice. Somehow or another, we have to find that truck. It can't have gone that far. He continues. Now, go hunt for it like your life depended on it. Ah! Cheer and I look at each other and sigh. 
How do you want to do this? She asks. Want to search together or should we split up? Let's go together or we should split up? Let's go together. Let's go together. And so Chiri and I head up in search of the truck. And as we make our way down, center guy peering in all directions, accidentally, accidentally bump right into a man who's out with his daughter. And that's uh, the, edit the editor from the magazine that uh, Minorikawa works for. Ow! Pardon me! I hop back to my feet and go to bow to the man in apology. Ow! Okay, everybody, both of them apologize at the same time and they uh, bonk each other's head off. But uh, Tama is fine because of the mascot helmet. Ow! He bows at the same time and he, we manage to bonk our head together. Bonk! Ow! So sorry! Sorry! As her dad drops to his knees, clutching his head, the girls begins to wander off. Hana, wait! The man lurches to his feet and rushes after the girl. She seems like an odd kid, only ten or so, but strangely cold and distant for her age. Hmm. As we make our way back down the road, Chiri's eyes light upon the cafe. Man, I am super hungry, she mutters. Not now! We have to find that truck! Yeah, I know. I stride purposely along, and though Cheery flashes the Adrian a long, lingering look, she falls into a step. She falls into a step behind me. Cheery and I wander around for another ten minutes or so. Huh? We don't see any sign of the truck, though. Ah! I sigh. It really is good and gone, huh? I turn to look back at Chiri. Huh? Wait, what? Chiri's gone. She must have slipped away from me at some point. I take a quick look around, but there's no sign of her. When she sees, when did she split off? She was just there two, two or three minutes ago. Twelve thirty-five. The sales demo started in twenty-five minutes. What do I do? I don't have time to go looking for Chiri. Guess I have to keep searching for the truck by myself then. But I have no clothes to go on, so I don't know how am I ever going to find it. Ah! What should I do? Keep out! Alright, so... Yeah, that was already 12.35. So yeah, this is a keep out for her. So let's go back with Minorikawa since we're at it. Since we found the editor in chief, maybe he has something to do with it. So. Aha! Pointing my finger! Minorikawa stood on the sidewalk, waiting his option. Shiaki's phone call has thrown him for a loop. He had expected her to be anxious about doing interviews, but wow, she was a real basket case. Still, that didn't change the fact that he had a schedule of his own to keep. The surveillance camera story had to be his top priority. Shiaki would just have to find some way to fumble through things on her end. He headed on down Donganzaka, scanning his surroundings as he went. There were cameras set up on streetlights all over the place. Hmm, different design too. There were so many it was hard to believe he had never noticed them before. One over there, one just over here, electronic side. Peering down on passerby from high above where they were tougher to spot. <coughs> Just how were the people who came to Shibuya reacting to the situation? Hey, you're there! Minorikawa called out to a man riding on by on a bicycle. Hey you, stop! The man brought us back to a sudden stop. This is an orange this is a guy in an orange jumpsuit riding a bike. I think we've seen it somewhere, but I don't forgot where. 
Huh? Uh, what's the matter? He asked. Hi, the name's Minoru Minorikawa. I'm a freelance writer. Uh, okay. I'm just doing interviews for a magazine, and I'd like to talk to you. A magazine? Which one? Four Star General Gossip. Minorikawa did his best to sound proud. Oh, well, I'm actually in a bit of a hurry here. Minorikawa soldier on. See that? He pointed out at one of the nearby surveillance cameras. What? The man asked. The blimp? Yeah, there is a blimp in the sky. A massive blimp was indeed drifting slowly overhead. A type of aircraft that floats using the lift provided by an enormous envelope filled with lighter than air gas. It's a blimp for Aya Kamiki, are you serious? Just how big this girl is! This envelope, the balloon, is often used for corporate advertising. This particular blimp has been pottering about the skies about Shibuya since last night. No, the camera! Oh, the camera watched them both in uncaring silence. Oh, that. What about it? What do you mean, what about it? Those cameras have been installed all throughout Shibuya. They're taking in everything and every anything. Privacy be damned. A shock pallor came to the man's face. Oh, uh, really? He muttered uneasily to himself. I guess I should be careful next time I go picking stuff up. Oh, I remember. This is the guy that picks up the trash with Achi. Oh, I just remember. Hey, what are you talking about? Minorikawa asked. Oh, uh, nothing. Uh, just stuff. Way to dodge the question entirely. Anyhow! Uh, I think there are some good things about the camera, too, the man said hurriedly. Oh? Minokawa asked. Such as? Well, I mean, they must have helped catch some crooks, right? Yeah, I think you're right about that. Oh, I am? The man looked shocked to have his own statement confirmed. Are you hiding something from me? Huh? No, no, nothing in particular. The man shook his head vehemently. Uh, nothing at all, really. Well, whatever, Munikawa said. In any case, even if the cameras are helping in arresting criminals, there are some places where people just don't want to be watched. What? For instance, how would you like if someone set up a security camera inside your home? What do you mean? I mean a burglar might try to get into your home. If you had a security camera, you could be alerted right away. Isn't that kind of an extreme argument? <laughs> nope! You're the one making the extreme argument here! What? The man stared bewildered. You're saying it's only for folks to film people around town as much as they might like, but not to take a look inside people's houses. Uh, yeah, I guess I am, the man, mum the man mumbled. Minokawa snorted. You don't seem too deeply about things, do you? He mocked. The man huffed in indignation. Uh, I don't see the problem, he said. I mean, it's a normal enough opinion to want to uh, bring down crime but also protect privacy. Well, yeah, so? So if they're just going to set up cameras around town, I'm okay with that. Mirikawa grinned inwardly. You being naive, he said. Way too naive. Naive about what? By now, the man was getting worked up. Once you start letting people watch you some of the time, you're eventually let do it more and more. That's how the world works. A simple change in camera angle is all it takes to steal the last traces of your privacy away. That's kind of funny coming from you. Doesn't Four Star General Gossip gets all his scuttlebutt by invading the privacy of others? Since when are you people concerned with personal privacy? Meaning what exactly? Minorikawa asks. You know damn well what I mean. Have you no shame? I've got nothing to be ashamed about! Minorikawa exclaimed. If some celebrity scandal breaks, I write it up in the form of a top-class, socially conscious expose. That's the Minorikawa seal of quality. The man rolled his eyes. Please, as if anyone ever heard of that. You everyday life freelance reporter would say something about how security firm have no right to use camera to disrupt personal privacy. But not me, oh no. 
I'm the only guy you write the first class piece on the subject. And you want to know why? The man's only response was a doubtful look. Because privacy only exists for me to utterly demolish it. Milikawa finished with a prideful grin. That... That's nothing but journalistic arrogance, the man railed. Oh yeah? Yeah, I'd rather have surveillance camera any day if the alternative is some weird gossip piece. This time, Milikawa didn't have a handy retort. An awkward silence descended over the pair. Hmm. Right. I see. Minorikawa muttered to himself as he busily scribbled in his notepad. The man was visibly taken aback. Thank you for our cooperation, Minorikawa said at last. You gave me such come you gave me some good stuff. He held up a hand to forestall an angry retort. I realize I probably got you a bit riled up. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, the man peered out at Minorikawa in disbelief. This is just my interview style. Sorry, I know it's a little unorthodox. Buddy, you're a weirdo, you know that? The man said. Yes, I heard that a lot. Minorikawa laughed. <laughs> uh, so, can I go now? Sure, I'll quote you as passerby in my article. Uh, sure, whatever, the man muttered. He quickly sped off on his bicycle. It was more like a trike. Like a trike, but with the back, it holds a, a carriage. Minorikawa now had some material for his surveillance camera piece. He wanted to organize what he'd managed to put together so far. He decided to head toward his next interview location, keeping an eye out for a cafe where he could stop to work on his copy. He used the map included in the project proposal to guide him. It was hard to read the works, the words and make out the detail, but it looked like the Nokani building where the burning hammer demo was being held was just down center guy. There was no indication on of which floor the event would be held down, however. That made him a little anxious, but he'd probably be able to find someone to point him in the right direction once he got to the building. Uh, he spotted a cafe up ahead. Coffee, please! He shouted out as he strode inside. He slumped down in the open chair. Hopefully, he'd be able to hold up in the air until 1 o'clock working on his article. If he couldn't have it done by then, finishing the whole issue by the end of the day would be a tall order. He pulled a cigarette from his overcoat as he waited for his computer to boot up. Having a smoke was Mirikawa's little trigger for going into writing mode. Writing mode, the state of being in the mood to write some text. As Minorikawa goes about his job, he switches between writing mode, interview mode, food mode, and sleep mode. When busy, he'll sometimes go into writing mode and food mode at the same time, sometimes even straying into sleep mode in the midst of food mode. <laughs> When he's even busier, he'll eat and write mid-interview while nodding off. This is known as ultimate mode. <laughs> what? Okay. Ultimate mode. So yeah, yeah. Something I need to know about Japan. Um, they smoke a lot. There is no such thing as a non-smoking area in Japan. Like they know, like the like they don't think there's a they have a strong uh, anti-smoking lobby, so it's like all right. Everybody know it's dangerous. People who smoke are well aware of the danger, and they just yeah. He stuck the cigarette in his mouth and lit it up. With the first heavy draw of smoke, he felt his mind focus. The rough idea for his article came to his head nearly fully formed. All he needed to do now was get it all written down. Finally, his laptop finished booting up. Took you long enough, pal, he muttered to the computer. His hand lapped to the keyboard like a predator pouncing on its prey. In a matter of moments, he had his hit his stride. His finger clicked away. One by one, line of text filled up on his screen. Oh, he's smoking Chitans! 
Filter! A waitress stepped up by beside him. Excuse me, sir! But Mirakawa was in writing mode, he didn't even hear her. Sir! Sir, I beg your pardon! Again, Mirakawa was deaf to the waitress attempt to get his attention. Sir, excuse me! The waitress smacked the table. <laughs> Quiet! Mirakawa snapped. He slammed the table right back. Don't interrupt me when I'm working, you not if you know what's good for you. The waitress didn't so much as flinch, she leaned in aggressively, getting right in Mirakawa's face. Oh, she's cute, she's in uh, early 20s, wearing glasses, uh, nice brown hair, tied up in the back, uh, having strong bangs. Sir, I hate to bother you, but I have to ask you to please refrain from smoking. Mirakawa blinked, huh? This is a non-smoking establishment, sir. No smoking? Minorikawa asked. The cigarette bob in, in his mouth as he spoke. Oh, the waitress pointed sharply to the sign on the wall. No smoking. The words were spelled out clear as day. We ask that patron please not smoke so that other customers can fully enjoy the aroma, or the aroma of their coffee. The waitress drew herself up in arrogant triumph. A woman sitting down at the table next ma next made a face as she tried to find the smoke away with her hands. Customer all around the shop were glaring at him. You guys don't know the first thing about the aroma of coffee! Minori was not scoffed. Oh my god. Is he gonna pull up a fight with a waitress? You don't have time for this, you loser! The scent of coffee only truly comes to life amidst the choking stench of to tobacco smoke. The waitress only response was to jab her finger again. But this time, she didn't point at the sign, she pointed to the door. Sir, if you're going to smoke, please take it outside. Sometime later, sitting inside the coffee, Little Trek. This is Café Little Trek! Minorikawa lit up his third cigarette. At last, a safe refuge. Okay, okay, so he, he changed he, he changed establishment. He moved to Café Lautrec because that ca that that's that's a place that allows smoking. In recent years, many cafes and restaurants have phased out the concept of the smoking section in favor of prohibiting smoking across the board. This makes a place like Lautrec especially important to smokers. There are large air vents in the ceiling to help keep the interior from ag more agreeable for those who do not smoke. Oh, I see. Yeah, the, there, there are some restaurants, yeah, they have nice ventilation systems, so they will allow smoking. Mirakawa lit up his third cigarette at last, a safe refuge. It had taken him quite some time to find a place that allowed smoking after he got kicked out of the first cafe. Now he was in a rush to make up for lost time. His finger flew over the keyboard at lightning speed. The more he wrote, the harder he focused. At this rate, he would have the story wrapped up in no time. Today, you hear me? A voice intruded suddenly in his awareness. One of the other customers was shouting. You're breaking up with that fellow today. Oh, this is Rumi. Mionikawa's finger drifted to a halt. Yeah, this is uh, Rumi and her father. He looked around to see where the voice was come from. had come from. An older man, red in the face, was shouting at a young woman who sat across from him. Please, Dad. The woman pleaded. Stop. You're making a scene. Ah, father and daughter then. Or for the father and the daughter then. It was rare nowadays to see a father behave so imperiously towards his own daughter. Just how sheltered had he been trying to keep her? Minorikawa couldn't see her face from where she was sitting, but his interest was piqued. Hey, should he move to another seat where she, he could take a look? Or no, he reminded himself that he needed to finish his article. No, 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 I'm gonna pry, I'm gonna pry. I'm gonna try to trigger a bad ending. Or if it's not towards him, it's gonna be towards Kano, and then I have to come back and uh, continue with the article. Should he move to another seat where he could take a look? Gathering up his laptop, Mirakawa switched to a different table. I don't care if I'm making a seat, the older man was saying. I'm not leaving until I see your cut ties with that boy, do you understand? I understand that you're never happy unless you get your way. You're acting like a spoiled child. <laughs> Don't you talk back to me! You don't understand your own situation! You're letting your emotion cloud your judgment without putting any thought on you to your future! No, Dad! You're the one who doesn't understand! 
The father-daughter argument was getting more and more heated. Dad was clearly furious. Minorikawa shifted closer, curious to see what might happen next. Then he saw the daughter's face and Gaia gasped out loud. Ho! Oh! Hey, I know you! You're, wait, you're on TV, right? The father scowled out of him. You must be mistaken, he said gruffly. No, I'm sure of it, Minorikawa said. What show, uh, what show am I thinking of? The young woman seems disconnected by his enthusiasm. Who was she? He called out to a waitress who was passing by. Hey miss, do you know this gal? She's an actress, right? It's right on the tip of my tongue. The waitress ignored him, but Mirikawa was under, undeterred. I know, I know this! Weren't you in one of those TV dramas or something? Mirikawa is probably thinking of a series starring Masami Nagahama, probably a Parisian called Col Cause, The Last Frenchman, Touched by a Tuna or Sailor Moon Pies, all of which receive high viewers rating and are fondly remembered in the public consciousness. What are those titles? Operation Cold Cause? The Last Frenchman? Touched by a Tuna. Sailor Moon Pies. I think that one takes the cake. Sailor Moon Pies. Right, we're leaving, the father grumbled. He rose from his seat, radiating aggravation. Huh? The young woman says, but... No waiting to hear her objection, he grabbed her by the hand and stormed out of the cafe. Hey, hold on, Minoyakawa squawked. His plea fell on dead ears. All he could do was watch them go, then shuffle back to his seat in disappointment. Hmm, damn it, what was her name? I should have asked for her autograph. Mumbling under his breath, Minorikawa went back to typing. Or probably... There's no way for us to know because we haven't seen the Kano timeline yet. But... What's that? His hands went, still that strange noise intruded into, in, on his reverie. Whatever it was, it was close by. What in the world is that sound? I need to get to the bottom of this or I'll never be able to concentrate. Uh, never mind, I need to focus on finishing that article. I'm gonna look at what that sound is. I need to get to the bottom of this or I'll never be able to concentrate. Just where the heck is that sound coming from? He searched his surrounding for a moment and quickly discovered that the noise was coming from his own bag. He pulled out some one of the most important tools of his trade, a bog detector. An instrument for filing listening devices. Since wireless devices emit, emit radio signal, bog detectors are designed to use wide array receiver to reveal their presence. Using a detector to find something in this fashion is known as fox something. It was on, and it had picked up a signal. To a reporter, information was life. That made owning a bog detector a sensible precaution in his line of work. With the device in the hand, Minorikawa casually scanned the area. Eventually, he zeroed in on the signal. He stood up. Everyone, your attention please, he announced. Someone set up a listening device in here. Several cafe patrons turned their head in disbelief. A woman reading pungent perfume flashed in and disagree, disagree, disagree with you. <laughs> A woman wreathed in pungent perfume flashed with a disagreeable look. Oh, come on, that's ridiculous, she huffed. There's something fishy going on. The only thing fishy right now is you, the woman declared disdainfully. Why don't you go get out of here and let everyone enjoy their meals? No, I smell a scoop. You what? You, what's your name? None of your business, that's what. Now hurry up and stop that awful noise! The other customer was starting to murmur loudly. There's a listening device here, folks, Minorikawa said. How can that not bother you? Do you know where it could be? Excuse me, the woman called out. Could someone please do something about this man? A waitress hurried over. Sir, please, you're being, you're bothering our other customers. There's a listening device in here. That's what people should be bothered by right now! The witches look, look a, took a reflexive step backwards at the word li li listening device. You're the one we're treating on everyone! The woman shouted. Oh, you're the one we're treating on everyone! The woman shouted. 
Honestly, could you please stop that racket? It's not me the racket making the racket. It's the Bogdad Tracker. Just who the hell do you think you are? Police! Somebody call the police! Ma'am? Ma'am, please calm down, the waitress said. There are other customers here and... I'll calm down once you get this, disres this disrespectful boar out of here. All I'm doing is showing the truth. You can't kick me out for that. The waitress wavered, clearly intimidated by both of them. You've got a lot... You've got a lot of nerve, the woman snapped at Minorikawa. Go play detective someplace else. I'm not a detective. I'm a reporter. Really now? By far my least favorite profession. Oh, uh -huh, and why is that? Did you somewhat, did someone write a story about you, lady? Got skeleton in your closet? You shut your mouth. How dare you? Yeah, I smell a scoop here, all right. And the smell is coming from you. Oh, stop it with your scoop nonsense already. It's no use trying to hide text from me. You have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, yes, I do, lady. Go to hell. After you. Blah 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 blah. Blah 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 blah. Blah 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 blah. As they shouted over each other, their words blurred together until they were barely words anymore. The onlookers could hear only indistinct, meaningless raving. This is a bad ending, right? And still the yelling went on and on and on. Eventually there came the sound of approaching sirens. But even when the police cruiser pulled up outside the cafe, the two didn't slow their bickering. Oh my god, they didn't stop. They didn't stop. Bad end. Number 22, sniffing for a scoop. Minorikawa lost his cool and got drawn into an argument with a stranger giving no thought to the consequences. By the time he came to his senses in the jail cell, he was too late to save the four-star general gossip. Maybe worrying about where Nose can wait. Right now, finishing up that article sounds like a better idea. No shit, Sherlock! No shit! What I meant to do is, probably when I shove the... The, 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 the... The, the, the Rumi and, and her father out of the cafe, probably I saved Kano's ass without me knowing it, cause probably he would finally find some time and go to Lautrec and then um, she would be coerced to um, by her father to break up with him and that would be a bad ending on his part. Alright. What's that sound? Weird sound. Oh, there was another. Oh, this I'm not changing that. Pen to paper, peculiar father-daughter pair. All right, I'm not changing that. I'm gonna change the weird sound thing. Well, never mind. I need to focus on finishing this article. Minorikawa tried to immerse himself in his writing again. Before long, he stopped worrying about the curious sound. <coughs> Twelve forty. Time passed. Eventually, the pace of his writing slowed down a bit, and Minakawa glanced at his watch. It was later. It was later than he thought. Pretty soon, he was going to have to head over to get an interview from the diet drink people. He reached into his bag from the project proposal to double check the demo location. Huh? The proposal? It's it's gone. Crap! Where the hell did it go? He checked all around the table, but he didn't see it anywhere. Maybe he left it at the other cafe, the non-smoking place? Of course he did. Well, he didn't have time to go back for it now. His phone rang. What now? Minorikawa snapped as he answered it. A tiny squeak came through the receiver. It was followed by the sound of sniffing stub. I'm sorry, I just... She okay? Was she done with her interviews, maybe? It's no use. 
people won't stop to talk to my, no matter how hard I try. Her voice broke up in further sob. Oh, come on, this again, really? I, I, I can't do it. Don't worry about paying me, just please let me go home. Minorikawa was already operating on a too tight schedule. He didn't have time to worry about Chiaki on top of it all. Look, just slow down and take a breath. Try to keep it a, a little longer. He should have seen this coming when he first called her. Her shyness was practically pathological. But if he caught her loose now, all this frustration would be for nothing. But, but I can't do it, Chiaki whined again. Please, just forget you ever called me. She hung up before Minrikawa could forget, could get another word from him. Word in. 12.44 already? And that phone call took 37 seconds. He tried calling her back, but she didn't pick up. Damn it, Chiaki! Don't you dare bail on me! Leaving money for his coffee on the table, Minrikawa jumped up and bolted from the cafe. The plaza outside Shibuya Station was, a crowd, was as crowded as ever. <laughs> Minorikawa looked around, but there was no sign of Shiaki. She bailed! Minorikawa dropped to his knees in despair. Ah! His last hope has up and left. There was no one else he could even ask. Damn it! All right then, fine. I'll do it myself. He dragged my, himself back to his feet. All right, listen up. Now he just jumped onto the statue of uh, Achiko, the statue of the waiting door where well, the girl used to uh, wait for the the the, 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 the the syndicate guys. All right, listen up. He shouted at the passing crowd. I'm doing street interviews here, starting now. You guys, shut up and help me. I mean, don't shut up, but help me. <laughs> He wanted up blowing way too much time just to get two pages worth of content, leaving himself unable to finish the other articles. In the end, the issue of four-star general gossip never made it to the newsstands, and heaven publishing went down for the count. Oh, that lead to a bad end? So what could I have done to save Chiaki? Chiaki calls it quits. Oh, that was the issue. Without Chiaki, Minorikawa just couldn't get the gossip finished in time. What made her run off, though? Chiaki shows off in Kano's story at 12.10. One of the decisions there it was is what ultimately put her, put her over the edge. Oh, Kano met Chiaki? Oh, we need to stop and talk to her then. All right. Let's save, let's save Minorikawa's career. And save the editor in chief's life because we see uh, legs, uh, legs hanging out from an, an office. So, all right, let's go see Kano. Kano had been watching syndicate members and of the attaché case for an hour and a half. He still had no idea where he really might be headed. The man he was tailing now was about ten meters away close enough that Kano could close the distance and apprehend him as a moment's notice. But his orders remained the same, follow and observe. He watched as the case was ending off once more. By now, the shock was seeing it pass to yet another accomplice has worn off. Uh, yeah, now we see the... The black guy gave this the suitcase to a guy who has a very huge a man ring on his hand, on his fin middle finger. It's, all, but it's already been 90 minutes, huh? Oh, it was Sasayama. At some point, he crept up on Kanos from behind. It's already been 90 minutes, huh? They don't seem like they're trying to get out. They don't seem like they're trying to get away at all, Kano said. They're just walking. What could they be up to? Sasama shrugged. Yeah, it's weird. Kano recalled Dick Dictum number 89. 
Dig dictum number 89. The more irrelevant something seems, the more irrelevant it's bound to be. If Tate knows wisdom held true, the syndicate must have some reason for what he was doing. They were just were they just trying to throw the investigator off their scent? No, that couldn't be it. They were wandering in circles, staying right in the same area. They were just running up the clock. What if that's exactly what they were after? Buying time. Kano felt a sudden conviction that he was on the right track. If they needed more time to make sure they got their hands on the ransom payment. Wait, hold on. Could it be that the real case had already been switched out? The ransom money wasn't even the case anymore. Those are two solid arguments. Probably we're, we're hunting the wrong suitcase or the ransom money isn't there anymore. I'm gonna go with B. Could it be that the ransom money wasn't even in the case anymore? I've got it! So say I'm not perked up. You got what? Each time these crooks hand up the case, they sneak up a bundle for, of a million yen. They keep doing that and that eventually the case itself is empty. Of course! That's how they've been playing us! Kano and Sasayama exchange a look. How many people would need to make the switch for them to get all the money? Sasayama asked. Hmm, 50 million yen divided by 1 million. That makes 50 people. That's it then. No, wait. 50 people. That many? That can't be the deal then, Sasayama said. Guess not. They both sighed in unison. The man with the attache case made his way back to Shibuya station. The heck? Sasyama grumbled. He's right by where he started. And it looks like the same guy too. And in the background we can see the, the guy with the orange Rudy and the uh, white bandana handing out flyers. Kano felt his frustration growing. He honestly looked like the syndicate was just randomly lugging the case around town. Near Shibuya station a girl approached the suspect. She was Japanese and currently unlike any of the other criminal accomplices. Oh, this must be Shiaki. She, yeah, she looks young. She has glasses. She's wearing some sort of uniform, but not a school uniform. She's a, she's wearing an interesting, interesting skirt and she's holding a notepad in front of a guy's face. She spoke to the man while showing him something on the notepad. He glanced at the notepad, but did not slow down. Within moments, he had left her behind. That's how she asked for people to talk. She wrote her statement on the piece of paper and shoved it on his face. Can you please tell me I need to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God. How shy can you be? Poor reporter wannabe. With moments he had left her behind, it looks like she just passed him a message. Well, that's sir, sure fishy, Sasaya muttered. What, the girl? asked Kano. Yeah, wanna go hit her up? Sasayama could only mean one thing, questioning her. Yeah, let's go, let's go see what she knows. B, she can't be involved with this, can she? No, no, let's, let's go see what she knows. I think it's Chiaki. Yeah, let's go see what she knows. Sasayama and Kano are over to the girl. Excuse me, miss, would like to ask you a few... Are you happy with your life? The young woman shouted. She trusted her notepad in Kano's face. Tell me this, are you happy with your life right now? Huh? Looking at the notepad, Kano saw the same question written here in the big bone letters. Are you happy with your life? The girl's lie... The girl's eyes widened in surprise if she hadn't expected the two men to actually stop and listen. Uh, right now, uh, sir, she continued more quietly, are you, uh, are you happy? If so, if you could please take this survey about, uh, you know, about your, your life, are you happy with it? The more she spoke, the more flustered she became. So Sarah Ma stepped in. Hey, uh, I need to know, did you speak with that western fellow just now? Huh? No, no, that's, this is what I'm asking. Sir, are you happy with your life right now? Are you happy with your life right now? Oh my god! That's not how you report! Kano got a sinking feeling in his stomach. That kid, this kid was looking for a religious convert or something. You did speak with him, didn't you? Sasayama snapped. What did you tell him? The girl's rambling abruptly ceased. 
Her already ruddy face went even redder and tears welled up in her eyes. Poor kid, Kano thought. She just out here trying to get people to listen to her survey question. There's no way she's part of this kidnapping plot. Look, miss, uh, for the time being, it would be a good idea if you would leave the area. I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to explain. The girl's only response was to start sobbing outright. I can't do this anymore. I want to go home. Kano and Sasei exchanged awkward glances. I want to go home. I want to go home. Passerby began shouting curious look at the trio. Kano, you get back to work, Sasayama said. I'll escort this girl to the train station. He didn't quite manage to stifle the embarrassment in his voice. Right, Kano said. He hurried away, his eyes already searching for the suspect he'd been tailing. Uh, is that the good thing? I have no idea. It didn't take long to find him. I'm just going to check the timeline quick, just to be sure. No. No, 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 no. I have to go back. I'll see if uh, my change... Wait, 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 wait. What time was it? What time was it? 12.10. All right. That is her. The girl, yeah, I want to go hit her up. She can't be involved with this, can she? So Sam, I flashed him a skeptical look. Don't let your preconception get the better of you. Could get you killed. Preconception, fixed notion that, uh, that has about something before the facts are known. Can be a hindrance of thinking freely. If you think about it too hard, you might fall victim of the preconception that preconception that cells are always bad. <laughs> I know that, but still, she doesn't come across as involved to me. Kano knew better than to judge people based on appearance, but he was still convinced the girl wasn't part of this gang. She just struck him as far as far too well. Inept, really. Alright, I'll i I'll look into the girl, the same I said. You keep following the attache case. Kano nodded, hurry up after the man. Which bring me to this which bring me to the same stuff. So is that Yeah, it changed. Oh perfect. That was the right thing to do. The bad end was erased. Panic at 12.15. Okay. The man's black guard made him stand out in the crowd at the intersection. It occurred to Kano that all of the criminals who had entered the attache case has been wearing the same black clothing. The fact made the whole situation even weirder. Could they really be ignorant that they were being followed while they were all wearing the same eye-catching outfit? It was more likely they were going out of their way to make sure the investigator spotted them. That did, still didn't provide any clues as to what they were after though. The longer Kano kept tailing these guys, the less it all makes sense. Was it really such a good idea to keep this up? Someone's life was in danger and they were just letting the, the kidnapper carry out their plans, whatever it was. The very first page of the Dig Diary spelled things out loud and clear on that front. Dictatum number one. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Ever. Dig Dictum. Right now, the single most important thing was ensuring the officer's safety. This was a situation where Tatano would have stuck to his guns for sure. Kano thought back to what day to that day three days ago. Three years ago. Flashback! Back when he was a patrol man. A burglar has shut himself inside a financial poly office and dows the place in gasoline. Yeah, yeah, that that that, that time, that story, gonna, he's gonna we're gonna have more details on that. Kano had just been on police box duty and was ordered onto the scene because his box was just down the street from the standoff. Nobody's assigned to a detective post right after graduating to the police academy. The detective position can be quite hard to come by. Candidates are selected for detective training only after accumulating enough experience working at the local police box. A very small type of neighboring neighborhood station manned by only a handful of officers. Hmm. Several officers surrounded the building, keeping close to that on the situation. 
suspect was shouting nonsense through the entrance of the first floor. Things were getting heated. A crowd of alarm on lookers had started to form as well. Step aside, I was said slowly from abyss the throng. A middle-aged man in a rumpled business suit as approached Kano as he over nervously in the edge of the scene. I'm sorry, sir, Kano said. You have to stay back for your own safety. He attempted to usher the man back into the crowd. A no-nonsense look crossed the newcomer's face. He spoke in a low voice. I'm Detective Tatino from Shibuya Precinct. What's the situation? Oh, sir, I'm so sorry. Yes, of course. Kano stammered. Then quickly explained. He hasn't taken he hasn't taken anyone else there, but there are still people on the upper floors of the building. Giving only a slight nod, Tateno marched straight up to the building. The plastic container of gasoline the suspect had used was on the ground at the front. Tateno picked it up and dumped the remaining contents out over his head. Gano was at a loss for word, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. I've covered myself in gasoline too, Tatino called out from the entryway. The tension in the air ratch, ratcheted itself up several notches. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? Kano heard the burglar shouting from inside. If you're gonna do it, do it, Tatino called out. We can die together. And, and he walked to get into the building. All Kano could do was watch things unfold through the plate glass window. Tateno was talking to the burglar, but Kano couldn't make out the words. The crook was clutching a lighter, his hand trembling. His expression was like that of a frightened child. Tateno slowly approached him and took firm hold of his shaking hand. The onlookers erupted into cheers and applause. Uh, Tateno handed uh, the now docile suspect over the detective when warily sat down against the planter out front. It was like something ripped straight out of a police drama. That was amazing, Kano breathed. You have to deal with guys like that as quickly as you can. You let a situation like this get a little out of hand and you never know how things might go sour on you. That thing was spoke quietly, almost as if he were talking to himself. As the police evacuated the rest of the building, Kano noticed that there were children and the elderly people among them. If the perp had managed to set the fire, there was no way they would have escaped in time. But, I mean, what if it actually set the place on fire? If someone's willing to risk their life, you're not going to convince them or anything unless you do the same. Kano still remember the awe it felt at Tateno's matter-of-fact tone. Kano had become a police officer out of really sense of duty. He just thought he would make Rumi happy if he became a detective like her father. Besides, civil servants tend to stay afloat in times of recession, and his time playing rugby meant he was in good physical shape for the job. He never really thought much about protecting the citizenry of keeping the peace. But now, here he was, in the presence of a detective who's literally lived his life in the line of duty with a second thought. A police officer never loses sight of what he's supposed to protect. Ever. Getting back to his feet, Tateno tugged off his gasoline drenched coat and walked away. Kano wrote the words in the notebook he just purchased, thus the dick diary was born. Interesting! So every time you pick a quote from him, he's gonna die. Oh, let me write that down. And then boom. Thinking back to the way Tateno had put his life on the line to rescue a bunch of strangers made Kano feel all the more raw about just styling these syndicate members. Letting the crooks just wander around wasn't going to bring Maria Asawa to safety. Of that, Kano was now certain. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect, ever. He uttered the fundamental dick dictum out loud. Well, you lost sight of it completely, a voice said of nowhere, out of nowhere. What? Kano spun around. Ow! It was Shizuo! Rumi was with him. S Sir? Kano stuttered. Weren't you supposed to be waiting at the cafe for... There was some low life there, so we left. Rumi's dad looked plenty mean under certain ordinary circumstances. Right now, he looked like a man possessed. Oh, I uh, uh, beg your pardon. I'm still on duty at the moment. 
I'm going back home, Shizu huffed. You're not marrying my daughter. He turned to walk away. No, please, just wait. I'm done waiting. Now I'm going home. Please, don't do this. Just, this, just hear me out. I've heard all I need to hear from you. Rumi, we're leaving. Dad, please. Goodbye. Seizing his daughter by the hand, Shizu stormed off without another word, dragging her behind. Shinya! She called her over her shoulder. Rumi! She was gone. Rumi was gone. Kano desperately wanted to go after her, but he hesitated in the agony of indecision. I can't turn my back now on my responsibilities. I'm a detective. My word has to be my first priority. Going after Rumi isn't what a good detective would do. Oh, Detective Tateno, what should I do? Tateno, I... Still, the dictum echoed in his mind. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Ever. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. I... I... Six months later. I think this is a bad ending. Six months later, Kano made his way through a small corner of a vast field in the Nagano countryside. Slowly and leisurely, he tilled the soil. He surprised himself with his own newfound enthusiasm for organic farming, learning more from Shizuo day after day. His father-in-law had taught him the ways of farming from the ground up and while things had been rocky between them at first, their friendship was now growing strong. Pausing to wipe his brow, he smiled at the acreage around him. He looked forward to tending the crops he sown until harvest came around. If he stayed on as a detective, he might well, he might well never have known the joy he now found in his work. And this wasn't the only seed Kano had planted. By the time harvest season came around, the new life growing within his dear Rumi's belly would be ready to celebrate it with them. Oh, 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 oh. How can it be a bad head? She's happily married with uh, Rumi. We got married. That's a good thing, right? Why is it a bad end? Well, I know how to fix this. But... I disagree, game. This is not a bad end. This is not a bad end at all. Alright. Minorikawa, you done goofed. Let's fix what he did at the cafe, particular father daughter pair. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. It was rare in our days to see a father behave so imperiously to his own daughter. He reminded himself that he needed to finish his article. Yes! Besides, if this darn lady looked anything like her father, he, he, he just as soon passed. Minorikawa went back to his typing. It took a few minutes to establish his writing groove with the two of the two still while the two still bickering across the room, but thankfully he soon regained his focus. Oh, then there's the beep. Alright, let's go here then. Wrapping up riding at 12.40. So, I avoided the bite ending with Shiaki. Time passed. Eventually, the pace of his riding slowed down a bit and Minorikawa glanced at his watch. It was later than he thought. Pretty soon, he was going to have to head over to get an interview from the diet drink people. He reached into his bag for the project proposal to double check the demo location. Huh? The proposal, it's gone! Crap, where the car did it go? He checked it all around the table, but he didn't see it anywhere. Maybe he left it at the other cafe, the non smoking place? Well, I didn't have time to go back for it now. Now it's Shiaki. His phone rate. What now? Minorikawa snapped as he answered it. A tiny squeak came to the receiver. It was followed by the sound of sniffling sob. I'm sorry, I just... Shiaki? Was she done with her interviews, maybe? It's no use. 
People won't stop to talk to me whenever hard I try. Well, the way you approach them, it looks like you want to recruit them to a real car, a cult. You don't even introduce yourself. You just says, are you happy with your life? And then handed them the notepad. Her voice broke up into further sobs. Look, I've got my own problems to deal with. You're just going to have to find some way to manage. But I can't. Sorry, I'm hanging up now. And so he did. He had to hurry. He had to get to the demo venue. But he lost the map and forgot the location. Check, man, he told himself. Where would they hold an event like this? Probably someplace big, right? But there ought to be a guide or someone out front, too. With these assumptions in mind, Minorikawa broke into a run, searching ahead as he went. He stopped when he caught sight of a particular multi-tenant office building. A whole stream of women were filling inside. All of them look a little heavy too. Pay dirt! This had to be the helpful company sales demo. He hurried into the building. The women were queued up down the hallway. This was definitely the place then. More confident by the moment, Minorikawa made his way up the stairs. Finally reached the front of the line. There was a notice posted outside the doorway ahead. Mirikawa read it out loud. Audition for the starring role in Sun TV Sumo Queen 2. No! It was a sequel series of a recent TV drama featuring full figure actress. That's it! Mirikawa exclaimed a new project. Proposal spring fully formed into his mind. He felt as if it had been struck by a bolt of divine inspiration. Big bodies, bigger names. A new arena opened for aspiring plus-size actresses. Never mind the diet drink demo, this was going to be Minorikawa's big story. Ha uh ha! -huh. Oh my god. Is this a good thing? Minorikawa managed to meet the deadline. The show, however, wound up being a massive flop. Sales of that issue of four-star general gossip were like la likewise lackluster, with an unprecedented number of copies going unsold. Oh no! The guy got hanged again? Mr. Toyama's death continued to spiral out of control. And before long, Evan Publishing was no more. Another bad end! Sumo showed us massive belly flop. <laughs> bad end number 21. Alright. So, Minorikawa wound up going to the wrong venue entirely. His main problem was that he didn't have good detailed direction to the Burning Hammer demo. Tama can do something at 12.15 that caused Chiri to head to that cafe and Chiri can help Minorikawa get to where he needs to go. Oh, they need to split up so that Chiri can bump on uh, to Minorikawa and show him the right direction. Oh, so that's how they're doing it. Okay, okay. Let's go back with Tama then. Where was it? Here? Or here? 1215. Shall, shall we search? Yeah. Okay. So this is gonna change a little bit. We should split up. We should split up! Chiri and I... Chiri and I go our separate ways searching for a truck full of junk. I make my way to center guy. Ow! I'm so focused on searching all over. I walk through, I lose track. Okay, this is still the guy. Pardon me. Sorry about that. Apologies, bonk. We already seen that. The girl is, doesn't give a fuck, she still walks away. The guy wanders off. Okay, so that didn't change. Izamitsu. Nursing my own sore head, I make it all the way to Shibuya Station, but there's no sign of the truck. I probably never find it just by wandering around randomly. 12.45, it's already 12.35. The sales demo starts in 25 minutes. I have serious doubt I'll be able to find a truck by then. Ah, what should I do? 
This is uh, keep out. Yeah, it's still the keep out. All right, that's perfect. This is still good. Still the, the keep out. Now going back to Minorikawa. It was all the way to twelve thirty-five. Was it twelve thirty-five for him? That changed the whole thing. I have to reselect that choice again. Okay. Okay. But then there's the beep again. Oh, upon looking up in confusion, is he fa is found is found his attention drawn to a young woman at another table and then one of these and one of these and one of these oh and this and this and this and this and this and that too she finished with a broad grin oh it's uh it's cheery so let me just repeat your upper order back to you one japanese style beef patty one spicy fish roast spaghetti, one chicken casserole, one French onion soup, one foot parfait, one chocolate parfait, and one Dulux chocolate parfait. Will that be all? What do you think? The waitress has anxiously awaited confirmation. Ryoko Kakinuma, a second year student at Midoriyama Academy Law School, she was hassled by a pair of hustlers on her way to work and she showed up five minutes late to her shift. The manager told her that those five minutes were coming out of her pay, so she's a bit irritated by now. Oh my God! The waitress was the guy we say was the gal we saved from the, those thugs by Hachi, and now she's um, taking uh, Shiri's order. She 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 stopped looking. Oh, I'm gonna stop to eat, cause since we uh, we split up, Tama wasn't here to tell her now now's not the time to eat. Oh my God! You forgot the large caramel shake. The customer was a full-figure young woman and sconed at a nearby table. Oh, my apologies. The waitress quickly jotted down the addition to, uh, to the order. Uh, that'll do it for now, the young woman said. For now? Yikes. She's actually planning on ordering more after that. Marveling at this display of appetite, Minorikawa went back to typing. Okay, so now you notice it's here. Now there's the beeping again. Now what? He heard the strange beeping sound again, subtly different than the first time. And this time it was closer. Seriously, what the heck is that? I need to get to the bottom of this or I'll never be able to concentrate. Never mind, I need to focus on finishing the article. All right, here we go. This is the decision I need to make. So her splitting off after me. Oh my God! Oh, look at all those empty plates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She, yeah. She ate four desserts. She had two drinks, one soup, one, two bowls of pasta, and five main dishes. The plump young woman set about devouring all the food she ordered, despite the strange looks she was getting. Now, that was an appetite to be reckoned with. It took her under three minutes to polish off the lot. Then looking not the least bit sated, so she picked the menu back right up. Was she still is going to, going to order more? <laughs> okay, that, that, this only happens in, in, in dramas and movies. Like, in real life, even if the, 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 the girl is chubby, she, she wouldn't be able to hold on all that that food that's not true Minorikawa was starting to take an interest in this young lady there might be a story here he conjured up a series of headlines in his mind woman in hell 30,000 calories in 30 minutes this is the equivalent of a of 100 pieces of shortcake 300 glasses of meat or not steak of rice to feed 30 people 
No, he needs something with more punch. Fruit for that and expose on obesity. No, that was no good. He wasn't writing out for a fashion mag here. A gourmet day in Shibuya. That was it! A gourmet day in Shibuya! He'd be able to whip something up if he went up with the foodie angle. Mirikawa got up from his seat. That's pretty impressive, he said to the hungry diner. Do you always eat that much? The young woman glared back at him. Not always, she said. Suddenly tension filled the air. Oops! What way? That was that way too blunt of me? I mean, she is a young lady after all. Maybe I should change up my approach. Who the, who the heck are you in? Who the heck are you anyway? The woman asked. I'm a freelancer writer. I was hoping I could do an interview with you real quick. Huh? You want to interview me? The suspicion was plain on her face. I do. I mean, girls all over the world worry about their diet, right? I hear that. Yeah. So, would you be willing to share your secret or your technique or whatever for how you eat without getting fat? What, me? Sure, I mean, look at the figure you're maintaining despite eating all this food. Oh, she's smiling! The young woman's expression brightened up. Oh, you notice? There's actually a lot that goes into all of this. Yeah? The basic thing now is to eat 10 meals a day. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> Minorikawa struggled to keep his jaw from dropping. 10 meals a day? She flashed him a chubby cheek grin. Oh, uh, uh, you don't know how diet works, do ya? She chuckled. Eating only one or two meals a day, that's what will, will make you fat. You gotta space your food into smaller portions throughout the day. Yeah, she's opting for the Hobbit diet. But then again, have you seen a, 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 a slender hobbit? They all look they all look happy, but they all look fat. Because they eat six meals a day. The second breakfast approach. <laughs> That's the fundamentals of dining right there. Right, but what happened to the smaller portion part? Yeah, she's eating like 10. Minorika wants to buy the stomp. Ah, I see, he said. Any other pro dieting tips you could share? Well, for the basics, I would always drink protein instead of tea, yeah? Drink protein all day? Seriously? Once again, it took all of Minokawa's willpower to keep his thought to himself. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, oh, there's still, there's this stuff called Burning Hammer too, but she trailed off with a little wince. Wait! Minokawa perked up. Did you say Burning Hammer? Oh, you know it? I've heard of it anyway, Mirikawa replied. He decided he was better off keeping his plans to head to the sales demo a secret. Here's a sales demo later on, if you're interested, the woman said, as if she were reading his thought. Oh yeah, it says, oh, there's the address too. The Nokami building, yeah, in front of the HMV. Nah, there, there, there's a bit of part of the map and the print looks... Oh my god, the, 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 the print of the bottle looks even worse in this flyer form than in the, in the, than the real thing. The full disclosure, I am working for them right now. She ended, she ended the Minorikawa and advertising pamphlet. There was a more detailed map for the menu included. What a stroke of luck. Now he didn't need to rely on the crummy map in the project proposal anymore. He had no trouble finding the venue with the building's various floor all broken down for him. And actually, I gotta get back to work, the woman said. Sure, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to end back and finish up my co- I'm gonna head back and finish up my copy here. The woman left for the cafe and Minagikawa went to back to his laptop. That was nice. That was really nice. He got some new info on the Burning Hammer sales demo, but he also lost some more time. The surveillance camera piece still wasn't finished. It was going to be a near thing to get it done before the sales demo started, yet instead of returning to his writing, he got out his cell phone. What if Toyama had gotten another of his crazy idea? If he tried to hang himself again, the thought at Minorikawa too, too worried to work out his copy. The phone rang several times before someone picked it up. 
Mr. Toyama, where are you right now? Minorikawa asked. Right now, I'm on the run somewhere near Shoto. Shoto, an upscale residential district, uh, despite being smack dab in the middle of the city, it's a quiet neighborhood rife with greenery. The residence of the former governor of Tokyo is here, built on a massive 2200 square meter plot of land. There's a shady hotel district a uh, short walk to the south, making for quite the, juxta uh, making for quite the juxtaposition. Toyama was speaking in an oddly hushed tone. Shoto? After you left the office, some guy came by to collect on my debt, so I made a run for it. Okay, so he wasn't dead, but the situation was still pretty bad. Look, we'll get you through this somehow, Minorikawa said, hoping it was true. Hey, just keep your head down and stay out of trouble, stay where you are, or you need to get back to the office ASAP. Uh, but... Wait... If I tell him to go back to the office, would he bump to Tama? Probably not, but would that be a good thing? I'm gonna tell him to go back to the office. You need to get back to the office ASAP! The office? But they'll find me here for sure! Toyama's voice was a little more than a pathetic whimper. It's a little bit of a reverse psychology. The last place the debt collectors are gonna think you went back is the two <laughs> It's uh, yeah, the last place the debt collectors are gonna think you went is back to the office, right? Oh, I see, Toyama said. He sounded impressed by the suggestion. For now, just so stay hidden until I can get this article finished. Alright, Toyama said weakly. He hung up. Minorikawa left out a deep sigh and turned back to his laptop. Keep out! Alright, so he's keep out. Okay, that's perfect. That's fine. That's very fine. So, at what time am I stuck with Minorikawa? 12.35, exactly the same time as Tama. So, let's continue Kano, since, uh, I think we started, yeah, we got rid of the bad ending on this side. 12.25. Thinking back to the way Tateno had put his life on the line to rescue a bunch of strangers made Kano feel all the more raw about just telling the syndicate members. Letting the crooks just wander around wasn't going to bring Maria Osawa to safety. Of that, Kano was now certain. Shoot, it's bleeding pretty bad, he heard someone say behind him. Oh, what the hell? There's a guy holding somebody on his shoulder. He, he looks like a head injury. He turned around and saw two young men carrying another along. There was a towel wrapped tightly around the third's head. Hey, what happened? Shut your mouth! Kano blanched. He has uh, sunglasses, a cap, uh, um, yeah, uh, some sort of baseball hat, and um, yeah, some sort of uh, pinch. Like, he looks like a young dog. I, I believe he used to belong in Archie's gang, but I'm not sure. Can the attitude, he's trying to help. Another voice got in. This is uh this is Sasayama. Still wearing his otaku suit. He's not being intimidated at all. Uh, did he finish dealing with the girl by the station then? What happened to your friend? On my way, man! I ain't afraid to kick your ass! Look, cut the crap and let me take a quick look. Sasayama unwrapped the towel from around the young man's head. Oh, that's nasty. The young guy was a little more than a kid. His head was so threaded with blood. He appeared to be unconscious. Hey, they couldn't leave it like this, but they were in the middle of a job. They should probably call German Affairs. They were in the middle of a job, but they couldn't just leave him like this. They should probably take him to a hospital. I think cops would call German Affairs. All right. Juvenile Affairs, part of the communal safety section which handles all the crime pertaining to public decency, finances, pollution and so on. 
Juvenile affairs deal with misconduct and criminal activity involving minors. Since many SOS members are underage, the Shibuya Precinct Juvenile Affairs Division has been ramping up this effort to deal with the gang, although one detective in particular has been using this as an excuse to go on patrol at arcades, ignoring his duties in order to fuel his video gaming addiction. Ah. <laughs> Kano took out his cell phone so he could call the precinct, but Sasayama stopped him and showed the two youngsters his badge. Oh crap, you're a cop? Sasayama nodded. Who are you kids with? The BAMF? SOS? BAMF must be badass motherfucker. Shibuya's number two guy and his leader, Soei Ikari, has gathered up some big mean dudes in an attempt to make Shibuya his thirst. The gang's leadership is inferior to that of SOS, but of an individual level, its members tend to be stronger in the fight. Word is that the rise of the BAMF is one of the reasons SOS have been growing more combative recently. SOS, admitted one of the uh, young men after some hesitation. Who attacked you? Yo, it ain't like that! What is it like then? In fighting? The young man was silent as Yama must have been right on the mark. In the course of his police duties, Kano picked up a fair amount of street gossip from the young people in Shibuya. Lately, the scuttlebutt around about the legendary SOS gang was that they were dealing with some internal strife. Look, don't worry about it, I get it. There's a hospital just down that way. Hurry up and get it there. The young man batted off Sasayama's offered hand and quickly hauled his friend away. Sounds like SOS is on the verge of breaking up with his all elders in fighting, huh? Kano asked. He kept his eyes on the young men as they headed off. Yeah, seems like it's been pretty rough. You know, you know what with the original leader leaving it all? The detectives in Geneva Affair are well acquainted with SOS original leader. That would be Archie Endo. Initially, SOS was nothing more than a small group of like-minded young people who hung up together, but as his membership grew, the general public began referring to the group as a gang. Word has it that back when Achi was in charge, gang members never started any conflict themselves, but simply responded in kind when other brought fight their way. The stories were like something out of some after-school special. There were tales of them taking down gangs, who sold drugs to kids or bringing to Yakuza front office to save their friends. The detective juvenile affair took these stories with a grain of salt, but if there really were young people like that out there, Kano hoped to, to meet them someday. The detectives had to hurry to catch up with the man they were tailing. He was still strolling along seemingly in no particular hurry. He kept in its sight as he crossed another pedestrian overpass and circled back around. Still following the same MO, huh? Sasayama grumbled. Guess so, Kano said. How are things go with the girl? He was careful not to take his eye off the mark as they talked. You're right. She's not part of this. Just one of those street evangelists or something. Oh yeah? Yeah, she kept asking me about... But are you really happy with your life? Wig me out. I build out of there quick. So, Sasayama, I'm thinking the attache case is going to get handed off again at any moment now. Huh? Sasayama appeared at the mark who was scanning the plaza. He just entered, apparently looking for someone. I take one side, you take the other, Kano suggested. Sasayama, Sasayama's eyes went wide. See what now? That way we apprehended board perps involved with the handoff. Sasayama didn't reply. Look, HQ isn't thinking about the hostage safety, Kano said. But that needs to be take that needs to take priority here. The Sama's face took on a great solemnity. Disobeying a direct order is not something to do lightly. Local Public Service Act. Article 32 states that a detective is to faithfully follow the orders of his superiors in the course of his duties. Violating this is punishable by a warning, reduction in pay, suspensions from duty, or dismissal. In the event of a warning, not only is the individual expected to submit a formal letter of apology, but pay raises may be delayed or performance bonus cut. Then after a moment, he added, but I'm on board. I'm stick to I'm sick of all this wandering around anyway. That's the Sasayama I know, kind of replied with a chuckle. Sasayama gave him a sound thumbs up. The 
two detectives took up position on opposite side of the plaza. Can you call up Sasayaman his cell phone? You ready? He asked. Just give the word. There were only two non-Japanese people in the nearby crowd. Both were eyeing their surrounding anxiously. Kano was certain the end up was about to take place. And then, well, well, well. If it isn't Mr. Toyama, Kano's ear perks up at the sound of an aggressive greeting, the voice dripping with a faint cheer. Oh my God, it's the Yakuza who um, harassed um, the boss of the, 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 the Burning Hammer. I forgot the Yashigata, and now he's uh, ha hassling uh, Toriyama. It's the same guy. He whirled around to see two rough-looking young men confronting a father and his daughter. The older man looked pained. Please, just hold on, he plea. He said, plucking the I just thought we agreed on four o'clock. The young man snarled. Don't you try and play down with us, buddy. It's nothing like that. I swear, my girl was just hungry, so I stood up to. Yeah. How come you didn't just order delivery, huh? Oh, uh, yes, right. I suppose that would work too. <laughs> Don't you ha 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 me, man? Kano watched the argument uneasily. The stranger altercation put him in a bit of a spot. The crook he was tailing probably wouldn't risk handing off the case with a hop roar like this going on. What's going on over here? Sasayama asked. Not sure, Kano replied. Looks like some kind of argument. I suspect our guy gonna get wary of us. It's gonna screw up the whole hand off. Yeah, I know. So do something about it. Get over here, Sasama said. What? Find some way to shut them up and then get over here. Oh, sure, all right. Can't wait it down towards the argument. He was only halfway there when Sasama called again. He sounded panicked. Hey, Kano! He made a run for it. He made a. Huh? Oh, crap. The man they've been dealing had vanished in the brief time Kano had taken his eye off of him. Wait up! Kano shouted. The Sama was racing after the suspect and Kano rushed to join in. The man was surprisingly quick, however, and neither detective managed to catch up. In fact, they soon lost sight of him amidst the teeming crowd. Frantically, they dashed through the streets as fast as hard as they could. We lost him, Sasama admitted at last. Damn it! He stamped his foot on the asphalt in disgust. Director Kuze, Kano gasped over the wireless. I'm sorry, but we, we lost the man with the attache case. It was a heavy sight on the other end of the line. Kano braced himself. He wasn't going to be able to weasel out of this one with just, I'll do better next time. Sasama! Sasama! Kano, get your asses back to the precinct. Kuze out. With that, Kuze switched off the line. Back to the precinct. Kano knew full well what they meant, what that meant. They were off the case. There was a gnawing in his gut. If those two punks hadn't showed up, no. If that father and his daughter hadn't turned up, he might have been able to apprehend the suspect. Aw, oh, don't let it get to you down, Sasema said. I mean, paper pushing can be kind of fun. The look on his face, however, suggested they didn't think it was fun at all. Not one bit. With the air of two men heading to an execution, Kano and Sasama trudged back towards the Shibuya precinct. Bad end! Is it because I, I sent him back to the office? Back to the precinct! Uh, bad end number 18. I'm just gonna check to be sure. Kano was taking off the case because he lost track of the suspect thanks to random altercation nearby and his glum conclusion was correct. If that father-daughter duo hadn't showed up, this wouldn't happen. A certain someone needs to give those two some better advice and a certain someone knows needs to meet up with them outside his or her house. Both of those are key to changing poor Kano's fate. Alright. So I have to fix Minorigawa's timeline. So I can continue with Kano. All right. Where was it? Here, right? Advice for Toyama. Yeah. 
There we go. We'll get you through somehow. Just keep your head down, stay trouble. Stay where you are right now. Just keep your head out and stay out of trouble. Just stay where you are now. Stay where I am? But what am I supposed to do? Toyama's voice dropped in and out. It sounded like he was moving quickly. Find some place to hide. Just lay low for a while, Minorikawa told him. All right, Toyama said weakly. He hung up. Minorikawa left deep side and turned back to his laptop. Keep out. Thank you. Was that enough? No, still a bad end. Hmm. All right, uh, let's start. Um, yeah, let's start Achi's timeline. See what's going on from his side. Running through center guy. Oh! Is half an hour away from bumping into Tama, so we gotta be careful there. Still running, Achi and Itomi scamper to the back rows along center guy. White sneaker and pump slapping on the pavement. Achi kept his eyes peeled, this continually checking ahead and behind as they darted through the gap between the buildings. Finally, they stopped in the, in the narrow alley. There's no way he'll find us here, he said. No one knows about this place. He took another look around and he let off sight of relief. It seems they managed to shake the gunman for now. Back when Achi was it with SOS, he had, he had come through center guy practically every day. Aboriginal for studs of Shibuya. Really? SOS stands for Studs of Shibuya, the name given to the group by Achi when he founded it. Originally just a bunch of like-minded young people hanging out together, it was since become known as a gang that picks fights around Shibuya. The gang had started as little more than a group of local teens. They didn't do much in particular, just horsing around and killing time. What mattered was that they were having fun. But it wasn't long until it wasn't all fun and games. Achi couldn't help but notice the slobs were making a mess of Shibuya, dirtying it all up. He wasn't about to let them get away with it. Most frequently it was folks who tossed cigarette butts on the street or plastered walls and graffiti. When they didn't respond to his more gentle warnings, he found slightly more forceful ways of getting his product across. SOS got a reputation, Sweet Punk started trying to pick fights with his members. Those guys required a bit more force to handle. And when it came to the worst of the lot, the drug dealers, the muggers, the guy who tried to force himself on women, it was a full on battle, no holes bar. Before long, SOS established itself as something of a vigilante group, soon as it became known as someone of the biggest gang in Shibuya. Let's lay low here for a bit and see what happens, as she said. The alley where they hid was like a dimly lit chasm, obscuring them from view. The only problem now was figuring out what to do next. They need to find that blue van again which meant figuring out the best way to get back to Doganzaka without the man with the cane catching them once more. Hachi? Itomi whispered. Hmm? I think I can handle myself from here. She got to her feet and gave Hachi a deep bow. Whoa! Hachi held up her hand. We've been over this already. You're not gonna be okay. That guy has a gun. If he let her go against that assassin alone, he might as well be the one to pull the trigger himself. Thank you so much for everything you've done for me, he told me continue as if he hadn't heard him. She started to shuffle out the hallway. Hey, what did I just say? Really, Achi, I appreciate your concern, but I can't in good conscience put you in danger anymore. But, I mean... Achi tried to press the point, but he told me cut him off. Cut him off. There's no good reason for you to risk yourself to keep helping me. 
Her tone was resolute, but Achi was determined to help her anyway. He refused to back down as she knew she had a point he decided to back off. Uh, I'll trigger the bad ending. Achi knew she had a point he decided to back off. But then, a bit of light shone on the alleyway from above. It looked like someone on the edges and building up her floor had turned on the light. Tama! At 12.05? Oh, the cockroach! The storm rooms opened with a rough grating sound. Okay, so where's the light switch? I fumbled around in the dark, feeling for the last switch box. My gusture pounds mute to the sensation of my hands enough that even finding that is difficult. I bat at the wall winningly until eventually the light comes on. Apparently I found a switch even if I didn't feel it. Whoa, what the heck is that? Am I doing this correctly? Nothing changed. It just jumps me back. It's a fake jump. I don't need that jump. I don't need that jump. I already made I already played that part. I don't need that jump. This is the moment where Tama opened the light. It looked like someone on the adjacent building upper floor had turned onto the lights. The light illuminated Itomi's face. When Achi looked saw the look in her eyes, he reconsidered his decision. She was trying her hardest to hide it, but she was clearly terrified. No way was he letting her go back out there alone. Still, if he tried to insist, she would only refuse him again. He told me, Humor me for a second here. Tell me what's the proper way to dispose of a plastic bottle. She stared at him in surprise. Uh, well, first, you remove the cap and the wrapper. Then you rinse out the inside and you crush it. And she let out the breath he'd been holding. Okay, good. Huh? I don't understand. What's good? You gave me my reason why I have to help you out. I super respect people, respect the environment. I'm one of those whatchamacallits, an environmentalist. And she pointed out his mean clean t-shirt. He told me it's dated. Uh, and what was your plan if he had said the answer was to toss the plastic into the trash? Well, then I need to stick it with you to help teach you. Environmental awareness begins with good education. So then you were going to tag along with me regardless? Look, I'm just super pumped to learn that you care so much about proper recycling. And he cracked a huge grin. Okay, okay then. Okay? If you're really not sure about it, I guess I could use your help a little while longer. She starts to smile a bit. He told me he flashed him with a little smile. Man, she's so cute, as she thought. <whistles> then something else caught his eyes. Huh? What's that there? I looked over. It looked like something black was stuck to the top of her head. Oh no, it's a cockroach! Achi, where are you staying at? Uh, you got something stuck there. What? On my head? Without thinking, Tommy reached out and plucked it off. It was about 10 centimeters long, its body, a glistening back, sporting feelers, and several pairs of legs. It began to ride and wriggle between Tommy's slender fingers. Yeah! Got you up. It's a cockroach! He jumped backwards, but Tommy didn't so much as flinch. Phew, sorry, that gave me a bit of a start, he continued. Guess it must have fallen from one of the windows up there. Still, Itomi did not move. Itomi? She didn't appear to hear him. Uh, hello, Itomi? Fuck. With muffled gurgle, Itomi passed on on the spot, her body as stiff as a mannequin. And she fainted. What? Itomi, are you okay? Itomi! He told me! He told me! 
but no matter how loudly I she called her name, he told me he could not come too. Oh, so that's why the jump is for. Well, from that day onward, Achi devoted even more of his time and energy collecting trash. It began his personal passion to see that his city was clean once, one, was a clean one, devoid of cockroaches. That was the mandate he had been handed, or if nothing else, his atonement. And then there's a there's a silhouette of uh, Itomi looking down on him like she's dead. She's not dead. The cockroach. Bad end number 19. All right, I know how to fix that. I know how to fix that. No worries. I understand why the jump is there for. I understand why the jump is there for. All right, Tama. Sorry, but you have to keep. You have to leave with your cockroach. Oops. No. Not here. Not here. I, I, I pressed the button, but I wanted. To, I want a triangle. I didn't want to. All right. <laughs> I need to act fast. I snatch up the cardboard box and make a run for it. I snatch a... <laughs> do, 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 do. There you go. Phew, I made it! When I get back to the break room, Mr. Yanagishita... Yanagishita. I try... I, I'm, I'm gonna need to remember his name. Yanagishita. 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 Uh, I wish I could jump back, but I can't. Okay, crisis averted. Sneaking out from the alley, Achi and Itomi began to make their way along the side street back towards Dogenzaka. It was a pretty big detour compared to the main thoroughfares, but that would be worth it if it meant they avoided the man with the cane. Achi looked over at Itomi as she walked alongside him. Her face was solemn. You could feel the intensity of her worry for her, for her sister. Oh, well, 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 look who's got himself a little cutie. The sun called him, started him, and he spun around. Oh, that's the guy. Yo, Mink Clayton, over here. And she spotted a young man up ahead, sneer at him. Yeah, those are the three guys. The guy in the middle, that's the guy who got injured. But yeah, those are the... They're about to get his ass kicked and get, they're gonna meet the police. At his side were two others. Achi recognized a lot. SOS. He told me let out a nervous squeak. Achi? Achi? Don't worry about them. He led her on or he led her onward, attempting to stride right past the trio. Whoa, hey now you're just gonna ignore me? That's pretty damn rude, especially coming from someone who used to be an old buddy. The tree tough moved to the bar to move to bar Achi's path. Oh, she is hella fine. Come on, ain't you gonna introduce us? Hella fine, extremely attractive. The etymology of hella 
is somewhat unclear, but its meaning is undisputed, very, a lot of, totally, and the like. Potential synonyms for hella fine include mighty fine, fine as hell, and banging. Sorry man, Achi said, I'm in a bit of a hurry here. He gave them a tepid smile. A big hurry, huh? Where to? Some love hotel uh, in, Mario Ma in Mario Yamacho? Too rich, another chimed in. She's a screamer, Achi, huh? Ah, ah, Achi! Take a stereotypical way to poke, fu to poke fun at a would-be an amorous couple. Now take Achi's name. There you go. Ah, 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 Achi! They burst out howling like a gang of monkeys. One of them cackled like a grinning idiot. <laughs> Achi! 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 Achi felt his anger boil. Hey, these guys were in sore were in sore need of a major ass kicking, but there was too much at stake. He was just going to have to suck it up and ignore them for the time being. Uh, yeah, you know what? If I leave them alone, would have give time for the police officer to tail the guy. Yeah, let's remove them out of the way. So that way we're gonna. But there was too much at stake. He was going to have to suck it up and ignore them for the time being. Grinning his teeth, he tried to slip past them, but the largest of the three grabbed him by the collar. You ran out, man! Suzumu's the one who runs this town now! You got no right to keep acting like you're the boss of us! He shoved Ashi up against the wall. Says who, Suzumu? So what now? Did Suzumu say I've got no right to act like the boss? Bitch, please. Suzumu ain't got no time to worry about your sorry ass. Ah, is that so? Achi's fist flashed out, catching the man clean on the jaw. He dropped to the ground with a dull thud. So, tell Suzumu this. Everyone in Shibuya needs to just play nice and have fun. Achi kept his stone light and jovial, but uh, he eyed the two, the, 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 the two other tall... The two other toffs like a hawk eye and spray. The two other toffs, the two other toffs like an eye... Uh, Sorry. Achi kept his stone light and jovial, but he eyed the other two. But he eyed the two other toffs active. He eyed the two other toffs like a knock eye in spray. Why is such a difficult um, sentence to read out loud? He eyed uh, the two other toffs like a. Two other toffs like a. My God. <laughs> is he going to be alright? He told me murmured. She looked at the man that she had laid out with some concern. Ah, he'll be fine. If that's all it took to knock him out, he's got no right to act all badass. Hatchy, huh? I don't believe I have the pleasure. A taller man with an angry gleam in his eyes had appeared at the top of the steps nearby. He must have turned up during the commo commotion. Uh, he has some. Uh, he has a mullet. He's a, yeah, he's a leather coat. Um, he has some large puffy uh, jeans with a black with some decals on it with a chain. I think it's Suzumu. What's he wearing? Uh, it looks like he's wearing in socks, but like it looks like he's he's walking in soft shoes. All right, so I'm gonna give him a grunt voice. Like a Mondo voice, since he looks like Suzumu, he radiates a distinct aura of menace. That's me, at your reply, and just who are you? For once it was someone he didn't recognize. The, the name's Yoji Kiryu. Rule, he used to roll with a gang from Ikeku, I, Ikebukuro until a few months ago, known as the Killer Whale of Bukuro. He answered... Any and all resistance with his fists, his crazy antics led to him being kicked out of the gang, however, and lately he's been hanging around Shibuya. The name's Yuji Kiryu. I joined up with SOS after you left. Now I'm Suzumu's number two guy. The newcomer stared at Ashi's face, 
size me up. Uh, a legendary founder. I've heard so much about you. The founder. It had been a long time since anyone had called him that. There's been a, a bunch of arguing over who would take charge of the new group that was forming to set things straight in Shibuya. At some point, folks had started telling him as the force behind SOS. But Founder, that was just something his buddy called him. He had never paid it much heed. Shibuya was a place for fun, not hierarchies. At least in Hachi's mind, that was, how it, that was how he's all to be. Burnings, it says Burnings on, the, on his pants. Look, how oh, you busted up some mean old drug dealers, rescued your pals from Yakuza bondage. Here bondage is used strictly in the terms of captivity. And any other types of Yakuza bondage will not be featured in this game. Sorry if the tip link here you got your hopes up. <laughs> <laughs> You're a real hero. Give you stung flick from his mouth like a snake's. He told me he shuddered. As she couldn't blame her for being creeped out. But that's all in the past now, isn't it? Kiryu continued. You went modestly on your way. It's up to us now. And we've helped SOS grow by leaps and bounds to help carry on your legacy. No matter who stands in our way. That thought didn't sit right with Archie. If aggressive expansion was the name of the game, the gang was losing touch with its roots. It wasn't about keeping Shibuya safe and fun anymore. Make SOS bigger, huh? He said. I'm guessing that was Suzumu's call as well. Kiryu didn't answer his question. His mouth merely twisted into a knowing sneer. In any event, I think these boys here need a little lesson in matters. The guillotine ought to do the trick. Guillotine, a capital punishment device invented in 18th century France. The condemn is executed decapitation by means of a heavy blade that descends from above, named the physician Joseph Ignace Guillotin, who advocated his use for the National Assembly. Both King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were executed by guillotine. I thought it was, um, I didn't expect the literal definition of the guillotine. I, I, thought it would, uh, it was, I thought it was slang for something. That's why I pressed the, the thing. The other gang member start, stared, started in alarm. Whoa, hey, uh, just calm down, man. Please, anything but the guillotine. Kill you point, pointedly ignore their pleas. Whoa, hey. Whoa, whoa, hey, what's the guillotine? As she asked, Kill you smirked. The guillotine is the guillotine. With me, worms. Without a glance back, Kiryu strolled away. His two underlings followed him unhappily. Hachi wondered what lay in store for them, but right now he had more important things to worry about. Come on, let's go! He took Hitomi by the hand and they were back on their way. Oh! Hitomi perked up. That's me! She reached into her pocket and took out her cell phone. Yeah, that's um uh... Huh? She stared at the screen with consternation. What is this? What is it? As she asked. It's an email from Mr. Tanaka. Who's Mr. Tanaka? Oh, he works with my father. I'm not sure what I should do. Achi remembered that the criminal had, had warned her against contacting her family or the police. She seems reluctant to even open this message. I'm sure it's fine just to read an email, he said. And besides, he's not the police and he's not your family. Yeah, you're right. He told me he scanned the message anxiously. It sounds like he's worried about me, she said. Then does he know about the kidnapping? Yes, I know my father trusts him. And he's always been so... Itomi cut herself short. Still, it was clear to Achi that she and this Tanaka person had some sort of close relationship. I wonder if it's... I wonder if it's safe for me to let him know what the situation is. 
I think it should be, as she told her. I mean, the kidnappers aren't going to know you're sent an email, right? He told me he began typing in response. As she rushed over her, well, speculation running through his mind. There was no way a mild mannered young lady like her would be dating one of her father co workers, was there? Oh, this is a jump to Osawa, but. Yes, there's an X, because I need to uh, free that uh, that timetable. Because, yeah, Osawa 12, 1220 is not open, so I cannot jump. Unless she was all about fighting herself a sugar daddy? No, he was being ridiculous as she banished the thought from his mind. Besides, he told me personal life wasn't the problem right now. The problem was that psycho with the cane and the gun. Is something wrong? He told me asked. She's finished sending her email. Oh no, nothing, nothing at all. That she did his best to look nonchalant. It was a good thing she couldn't read his mind. That's Ashy theme song. They exited Center Kai and resumed their approach toward Dogenzaka by way of Maru Yamacho. Mario Macho, there are many hotels in Mario Yamacho. There are, these are not ordinary establishments, but rather the sort of hotels where two people who are so inclined might redact it. A couple added to this kind of place in the early afternoon would without a doubt be assumed to be bent on redacted. You might be wondering whether an option for these two or to get up. You might be wondering whether an option for these two to get up to mischief would appear as a selection prompt. Well, don't get your hopes up. This is this isn't that kind of game. <laughs> Another long detour to decrease the odds of running into the gunman. They made an unlikely pair. Scruffy Achi Lings. Scruffy Scruffy Achi Limbs lackadaisically swinging to hide his embarrassment and brisk purposeful Itomi. Lack a dice, like a I what's is that? I never heard of that word. Lack of basically. Actually, found himself watching her out of the corner of his eyes. He could still feel her anxiety. He wished there was some way he could ease her fear. Hey, Tommy, mind if I ask you something? Mm hmm. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, like, I realize this might be kind of a weird question, but. He put on a serious face. What does the echo in echo friendly mean? Huh? Like I know it's about helping the earth and all, but I don't know what it really means, you know? He told me he thought about it for a moment. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's short for the I'm pretty sure it's short for the English word ecology, which is the science of examining the relationship between man and nature. All oh, right, science! Pleased with himself, Achi chattered on excitedly. Faint smile crept back into it, onto Itomi's face. Say, uh, you ever heard about the clean river here in Shibuya? A clean river? In Shibuya? Really? Ask a hundred youngsters outside of Shibuya Station the same question and you probably get that same answer a hundred times. Yeah, the Shibuya River. You know, that drainage channel we saw earlier. Wait, that? That's the clean river you're talking about? By no reason reasonable definition was the Shibuya River was anyone would call clean. That's the one, Shibuya grinned at her confusion. See, the river used to be clean a long time ago. I read about it in an old book called The Science Strikes Back, a popular monthly magazine abbreviated SSB. The series has been running for 29 years now, but the Strike Back appendix is still immensely popular with children. The woman who handles the home deliveries is known as the SSB lady, and children wait excitedly on the 25th of each month to make, for her to make her rounds. 
I used to have that book! Itomi chirped, her eyes wide with excitement. You're talking about that bit with the river that got turned into a song, right? The famous 1912 song Aru no Ogawa, The Spring Book, The Spring Brook, with lyrics by Tatsuyuki Takano and music by Teichi Okano. It's said that the song was inspired by the view of the upper course of the Shibuya River during Takano's childhood. In the modern day, there is a stone monument bearing the song's lyric along the Odakyu line between Yoyogi Achiman and Sangobachi. The Spring Brook, Aru no Ogawa. Yeah, that's the one! You read it too? I did! Achi felt a giddy, a giddy rush at this unexpected connection they share. Imagine if there was still a clean, beautiful here, river here in Shibuya. It'd be perfect place for taking a romantic stroll. Tomi looked up at Achi. She seemed to share his joy at this idea. Wouldn't it be amazing, Achi said, if that dirty little channel could be clean like it used to be? It would! Maybe as amazing as the look on Itomi's face right now, Achi thought. Itomi, tell me some more ecology stuff. Hit me with whatever you got. She seems happy to oblige, and so as they walked along, Itomi explained the bits of knowledge she picked up over the years. Achi was quiet, hanging out on every word. The return uh, to Donganzaka became an impromptu environmentalism lecture. He told me to continue until she exhausted her ready knowledge. I just don't get it, Achi grumbled when she pauses at last. I mean, why is it a bad thing if the planet gets warmer? Wouldn't that make winter in places like Hokkaido way easier? No, you see, because if the whole planet gets warmer, it will cause the whole ecosystem to collapse. Achi racked his brain. And the ecosystem is what again? Is that like a solar system? Images of the cosmos fill his imagination. No, no, not really, Tomi said. So, is it more like a sound system, then? Not really. Oh, but anyway, you're saying the problem is with the... with the... what was it again? Carbon... carbon... um... dioxide. Yeah, yeah, that stuff. I'm going to have to cut it down on that. Uh, sure. Yeah, cut carbon dioxide. Maybe he's talking about his carbon footprint. Whoops. That sells it, and she care proudly. No more soda for me. Soda? Yeah, that's carbonated, right? You told me bust out laughing. <laughs> what? I'm serious. You don't think I can do it? I'm sorry, you told me said catching her breath. It's just her face froze, her mirth abruptly vanishing. Oh no. Huh? And she stared at her face in alarm. What is it? Him again! He turned his attention to the direction that Itomi was looking. The man with a cane was bearing down on them. Oh come on! You have got to be kidding me! He grabbed Itomi's hand and ran. This time he headed for the main road, hoping to get lost in the crowd. Itomi struggled to keep up. She was exhausted all all their She was exhausted after all their earlier running. You can do it! He told You can do it, he told her. The guy's got a cane, we cannot run him. The assassin was still hurrying after them. Once we get around the next corner, we'll be out of the main road. Yeah, okay. She strained to get the words out. Bit by bit our feet were slowing down. It was another fifty meters or so to the main road. And she realized that they might get caught before they got here. Sorry, Tommy, exclaimed, but I gotta do this. He scooped her up in his arms. Huh? Eek! By the time he squeaked, the squeak had escaped her mouth and she was already running full out. Uh, Achi! Please! Please put me down! Don't worry, you're super light! As she glanced back and saw the assassin now far behind break off his pursuit. <coughs> But just as they rounded up the corner, he heard the man call up to him. Achi almost stopped on reflex. Hold on, did he just shout my name? How the heck does he know my name? Quaking with her knees, Achi slipped into the crowd. Uh, 
Archie, could you please sit me down now? A meek voice pulled him from his panic. Huh? He looked down at the girl in his arm. People in the crowd all around them were watching and chuckling. I mean, I'm really happy you saved me and all, but being carried around like this is, uh... Tommy was blushing beet red, but Archie's expression has gone pale. Archie, wait! Had he really heard that right? Well, that was it really... That's what it sounds like. He said he told me back on her feet, then used his shirt sleeve to wipe the sweat from his face. You okay? Tommy asked. When we were running just now, did that guy say anything? No, not that I heard, no. Huh. I didn't just imagine it then. Maybe she was sure he didn't recognize the man. There's something weird about that guy though. He told me murmured. She furrowed a brow. No matter where we uh, no matter where we run, he keeps catching up to us. It's almost like he knows where we're going. She was right. Finding a particular pair of people in a place as big as Shibuya bordered on the impossible. And yet somehow the assassin had tracked them down several times now. Yeah, she said. It's like he's got some way of locating us or something. He got a sudden idea. That's it! What if we're doing the whole tracking thing like backwards? What? He told me his eyes widened. Okay, so you know in police shows they always take a tracking device in the bag with the ransom money like that. Like that, but backwards. So backwards isn't the right way to describe it, but actually doesn't realize that he does seem to know what a tracking device is at least. Uh, yeah. Backwards? Yeah, like instead of putting the tracker on the money, they put it on you. He told me frown. I don't see I could possibly have a tracker on me, she said. I mean, I'm just wearing my clothes from home. Oh, uh, well, then how is he doing it then? Barely a moment passed for the moment he got the words out of his mouth. Once again, the man with a cane stepped out of the road ahead of them. It really didn't seem as if he knew exactly where they were going to be. How the hell is this happening? Achi groaned. He reached for Tomi's waist, ready to pick her up again. It's okay, I can run by myself. Achi took her by the hand instead and they raced into another alley. This guy would just not give up! At the far end of the alley, he could see a forklift parked beside a pile of cardboard boxes. Achi decided to A, throw the boxes at the pursuer up into the forklift and drive at the assassin. You know what? Let's get dangerous. Up into the forklift. This ends now! Achi leapt into the forklift and hit the ignition. The, igni the ignition roared to life. He lowered the forks and stepped on the accelerator, pick up the pallet of cardboard boxes as he charged toward the cane, the man with the cane. The tower of boxes struck the man with a thud as she kept accelerating, driving him back to a good 10 meters or so. The gunman let out a low grunt at the impact. Ashy then hit the brake, shifted back into reverse and hit the gas again, backing up as fast as he could. The boxes crashed down in a heap, burying the assassin underneath. Several small bottles spilled from the broken cardboard and shattered on the pavement. Hey, what the hell are you doing? A middle-aged man in a sanitation uniform come running at the sound of the forklift. Sorry man, gotta run! That chick screamed as he jumped from the vehicle. And don't forget to recycle that glass! He took Hitomi's hands and spread it away down the alleyway. The sanitation worker glowered after him, then turned and gazed despondently at the jumbled, jumbled pile of box and broken glass. As we see the guy, the assassin's guy, we see the hands holding a gun coming out of the pile. It's like, oh my god, he's not dangerous at all. Like, he's not, like, threatening looking at all. Like, ooh. <laughs>
Their ragged breathing echoed through the maze of side street. All that work just to wind up fleeing for their lives again. At, at she ground his teeth in frustration. There are two main types of cheat grinding. One, the subconscious act of gritting one's teeth together while asleep. Two, gritting one's teeth together as a response of, to anger and frustration. Here we have an example of number two. At roughly at the same time, Minoru Minorikawa is grinding his teeth while trying to keep his to keep his schedule. All right, so this is gonna break his. Yeah, this is gonna break the the keep out at 12:35. Let's jump. And let's tear down that uh, police tape. Back at Minorikawa. Minorikawa took a look at his wristwatch and gritted his teeth. Damn, is it that late already? He needed to head back to the sales demo. The surveillance camera article wasn't done, but he just had to leave it where it was for now. Hmm? As he was slipping his laptop back into his bag, his cell phone rang. He looked at the screen and saw Shiaki's lane listed in the co incoming caller. Was she done with the inter interviews? Hurriedly pick up. Shiaki, how's it going? Several wet sniffle came to the uh, receiver. Hey, are you crying? It's no use. Shiaki's voice was indeed punctuated by sob. People won't stop talking no matter how I try. Oh, come on! This again? Really? I can't do it! Don't worry about paying me, just please let me go home! Minori Kawa was already operating on a too tight schedule. He didn't have time to worry about Shiaki on top of it all. Look, just slow down and take a deep breath. Try and keep it all a little longer. He should have seen this coming when he first called her. Her shyness was practically pathological. But if he cut her loose now, all this frustration would be for nothing. But I can't do it! Shiaki whined again. I'm sorry, I really am! Look, just calm down! Minorikawa was practically screaming into his phone. Just stay where you are until I get there, okay? Got that? Whatever you do, just don't move! Leaving the money to, for his coffee on the table, he strolled out of the cafe. Street interviews were tougher than they looked. Not many random passerby were willing to stop and do a back and forth. Still, being able to talk to people on the street was a fundamental skill for a freelance reporter. All Minorikawa wanted for was for Shiaki to put a little effort to make it happen. Although he found her personality frustrating, he actually quite liked her writing. Reading her words, you'll never guess what she was like in person. If she could just break the right story, he was sure readers would be quite taken with her. There was no time like the present. The plaza outside Shibuya Station was crowded as ever. Minorikawa looked around and soon spotted Chiaki. Hey, what are you doing? he asked. Oh. She was hunkered down in front of the statue of Hachiko, squatting in an odd position. Oh. A group of kindergartners was gathered nearby, peering at, at her with sadness in their eyes like she was a stray dog or something. A pair of girls from Midoriyama Academy's kindergarten they always hang out around the train station after school. They are quite fond of killing time outside. Inside of the Tokyo 5000 series display card, the new landmark by the Achiko entrance. The beat up, the beat cop at the station police box was nicknamed the, kid, the Kinder Partners. They're the Kinder Partners! What's this all about? Minorikawa asked. This is how I end up when I lose all my self-confidence. I just want to hide. Oh, for crying out loud, get up, will you? Uh, I don't want to. Stop crying. Jackie sniffled and wiped out her eyes. Uh... Let me ask you this. Mirakawa stared out at her. Oh, now we see the, the, the little cutie. The cutie from kindergarten, they both of them are eating lollipops. Like the, the, the big ones. What was it that made you want to be a freelance writer? I... Uh, well... I guess because I wanted to try my hand at writing. A dangling bit of mucus bobbed in and out of Shiaki's left nostril as she spoke. Okay, Mirikawa followed. And why is that? Um, well... 
I'm too embarrassed to say. Shiaki hid her face in her hand. Okay, never mind that then. Right now you have a task that's been handed to you. You can't just say you can't do it. Minorikawa tried to keep his tone calm. No magazine in the world is going to let your novice writer just write about whatever they want. You have to prove yourself first. Get your fundamentals down. I already know all that. Mirikawa took the notebook from Shiaki's hand. Hey! She squeaked. Wait, you only talked to... You only talked to one person so far. There sure wasn't going to be a story in that. Yeah, uh, well, not a person exactly. Wait. Was this there? A cat? No, I mean, yes. There was a person in a cat costume. Tama! Alright. Now we just unlock... Okay, so... Minorikawa is the thing from 1250. And now we just un unlock the path at 1235. Alright, what should I do? What could the truck be? I'm starting to wreck in my brain. I hear a voice call up from behind me. Uh, excuse me. Are you, uh, happy with your, uh, your life right now? I turned to see a woman holding a notebook. Huh? Uh, I mean, I just, sorry, do, uh, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? I do not have time for this right now. I'm more than a little busy. Oh, no, uh, I mean, I understand if you can't. She, she's giving me this hyper-intensive stare. I can't tell if she's trying to be intimidating or if she's actually afraid of me. Something about her is definitely off. Way too jittery and suspicious for my liking. <laughs> Whatever she wants, I'd rather not get involved. I'm actually pretty busy, I say. Oh, um, but, uh, I mean, just real quick. I'd be a huge help. Please? Brett? Please? I really... Please? She bowed. Oh, so many times she looks like one of those drinking birds. A toy bird that functioned by means of a simple heat engine mechanism what caused it to constantly dip his head into liquid and then rise it back up. Sometimes falsely claimed to be a type of virtual motion device, once a common sight in offices the world over. Hey, I can't help but feel bad about this poor girl. I guess I can give her at least a few moments of my time. This girl is kind of creeping me out. I decide to ignore and move along. No, 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 no. Help her out. I can't help but feel bad about this poor girl. I guess I can give her at least a few moments of my time. All right, but please make it quick. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. She goes back into drinking bird mode. So, what was the question? Oh, right. Um, so, are you, uh, happy with your life right now? Oh, uh, well, right now, as you can see, I am a cat. Oh, a cat. Well, yes, I see, a cat. So, um, yeah, I'll put down cat. She just writes the word cat in her notepad. Right, thank you! Uh, what, are we finished already? Yes! Yes, we can finish right there! She hangs her head a little and looks away. Wow, that sure was quick. I'm not sure I get what, I, what it was all about. Did I really give her enough to be useful? I doubt it, but uh, hey, at least it was over fast. I head off in search of the burning hammer once more. No matter where I wander though, I don't spot the truck anywhere. Now, there is only 15 minutes before the demo is supposed to start. I'd better make my way back to the venue. Maybe Cherry had better luck in her search. Back in the break room, I met with Mr. Yanagishita, who positively radiates despair. Huh? 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 Did you find it? Did you find it? I'm sorry. I tried. <coughs> Yanagishita's shoulders slumped over at my response. 
Have you heard of Cheery? I ask. No, nothing yet. I guess she's our last hope. All of a sudden, Mr. Yanagishi dials up a pendant. The situation's rough. I'd like you to wear this. It's a miracle stone, like the one I saw back. It's a miracle stone, like uh, the one I saw back in the storeroom earlier. This ought to keep up your lock a notch. Now I see that Yanagishita is wearing another miracle stone all around his neck. Using one a bit of a sham I merchandise to. <laughs> using one bit of a sham mass. <laughs> using one bit of a sham merchandise to help find another. Nice. This is the pinnacle of pitiful. That's what this is. Hurry up, put it on, before the luck runs out. Mr. Yanagishi's eyes are all bloodshot. Something tells me that refusing his request wouldn't be wise right now. After a moment of hesitation, I take a hold of the pendant. The stone is blue and glittering. Is that cheery? Mr. Mr. Yagashi, Mr. Yanagishita said. He whips out his phone. Oh, no, sorry. He mutters after listening for a moment. I think you have the wrong number. Guess it isn't Shiri after all. Okay. Okay, okay. And yet she stays on the... And yet he stays on the line. Huh? Really? His tone suddenly does a complete 180. Yes, please. Thank you so much. As soon as he hangs up, the Anagishi does throws a victory pose. It's a miracle! Burning Hammer is back, baby! Huh? The recycling guy realized this mixed up and returned the box to the loading dock. Wow, for real? You girls did great. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. I've never seen someone so close to literally jumping for joy. Yeah, he's dancing on the table. That's pretty nice effect. Cause they 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 have to take like multiple pictures, yet the cat isn't moving one inch. Woohoo! I'm going to go prep the demo room! Tama, you go bring the burning hammer inside. With that, Mr. Yanagishita practically flies out of the room. No way, I murmured to myself. This thing didn't actually work, did it? I examined the miracle stone more closely. It just looked like some kind of joy, toy jewelry. I wish that I actually get paid my 20,000 yen. Hey, it's worth a shot! With the miracle stone still clutching my hands, I hurried out to the logging dock. I braced myself before actually stepping out the door. It's not there! Where is it? Ay, 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 ay! I look and I look, but I see no sign whatsoever of any burning hammer. In a panic, I call the recycling guy. Well, I definitely returned it to the loading dock. I can assure you of that. If you're telling me it's not there now, unfortunately, that isn't my responsibility. He hangs up. He didn't even sound like he cared. I looked around a little more, but to no avail. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not here. Did someone else take it, maybe? As I hang my head in dismay, a middle-aged man in sanitation uniform passes by, holding a big garbage bag. Oh, no. Did Achi broke the burning hammer? He did. He totally, totally did. Oh, no. That was all the broken glass was all about. He flashes me a curious look. What do we do, Tama? Mr. Yanagishita freaks out when he hears the burning hammer's missing. Please, you gotta give me something. 
I'm not really sure, sir. Now my boss is an even bigger wreck than he was before. This job is toast. Any money I was going to get paid is going up in smoke. Just like all my hopes and dreams at this point. I guess maybe we could try selling the Anagachis or something? It's not much of a suggestion, but it's all I've got. <laughs> Mr. Yanagishita looked at me intently. Wait, what did you just say? Huh? What did you just say? Or uh, something? No, before that. I guess maybe we should try selling the Anagachis? I can almost see the wheels turning in his head as a smile slowly creeps back into his face. Oh my god, what have I done? That's it! That's it! That's it! I'm certain I see an actual gleam in his eyes! Right then, I guess that's our only real option! No wait, this is a sign! That burning hammer didn't just vanish by coincidence, oh no! He jolted, he jolted to his feet and his eyes still possibly a glow. Alright! See you later, Anagachis! We're about to knock you right out of the park! I probably don't need to tell you how the event goes down. We don't manage to sell even a single Anagachi. Turns out! Hey, people are really creeped out by eels, and our customers have no problem letting us know that very impolitely, I my lad, as they storm away at in a half. But... Chiri said she liked eels soft boiled and in sushi. I hear Mr. Yanagishita murdered himself as I get ready to leave. If only we hadn't lost the burning hammer, things would have gone so much differently. Oh no! Maybe they would have got pretty much the same. You know, I probably should have listened to my god earlier. Agreeing to take on this job has brought me nothing but trouble. Bad end. Number 20, Anagachi. I know how to fix this. I know how to fix this. I wanna check out something? Return to title screen. I don't know, maybe. No, that's not where I want to be. So, I have no control over the sounds. Persistent Pursuit. Throw the boxes at their pursuer. Ah! As she snatched up the nearest box, turned and threw it in the main man with a cane. The box was filled with something, something heavy. This ought to do some damage. He watched with satisfaction as it struck the assassin in the face. The man staggered sideways. Here, have another! One by one, Achi earled every box in the pile. And one for, and one for the road! Uh oh! The last box was probably sealed, it broke open and it struck with pursuer, sending several bottles flying. They shattered as they crashed onto the street, splashing red liquid. The assassin dropped on one knee, scrubbing at his face with his hand. As she looked on in surprise. He couldn't possibly have hit the guy that hard. Fearing the man more closely, he saw that he was splattered in red liquid. Apparently the stuff in the bottle had gotten in his eyes. Oh! 
Oh, he got curry up his eyes. All right, all right. Now's our chance. I should took off with Tommy, leaving there, pursuer leaning with the alley. Uh, did that do it? Yeah, it was only one. Yeah, it was only one box, not the whole thing, not the whole uh, package. All right. The rag breathing echo through the maze of side street. All that were just wind up fleeing. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Actually, growled his teeth in frustration. Wait, 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 wait. That's not where I wanted to go. That's not where I want to go. You know what? Never mind. I'll just leave it there and go straight to Tama. Let's head back for now. All right. So back. No way! I murmured to my, I murmured to myself. Oh yeah, this thing did actually work. I braced myself before actually stepping out the door. It's there! It's really there! The cardboard boxes are scattered all around outside. Wait, scattered all around? What happened to them? I suddenly have a very bad feeling about this. A parental gnaws at me as I open one of the boxes. No! I shrieked and my vision dims. The box is full of bottles of burning mammer all of them smashed to pieces to be continued that's how the story was supposed to end so at one they don't have any any product that was weird So we just finished Tama story, okay. So who else? Let's finish. Uh, let's finish Ashi. The rag breathing echo to the maze of the street. All that work just to wind up fleeing for their lives again. Ashi ground his teeth in frustration. He told me, he groaned, then he slowed down to catch a breath at last. I'm so sorry. He told me he was nonplussed. Sorry? Whatever for? I keep saying how I'm going to help you, but instead I just keep putting you in danger. Actually, no. If you hadn't been with me, I sure I already be the No! Achi hurried to cut her off before she could finish. Don't go there, please! He sighed and spoke again more quietly. I just want to help you. Clenching a fist, he looked up at the sky. 
A tiny sliver of blue was visible through the narrow gap between the buildings. Itumi hung her head. Honestly, I can hardly believe how much you've done. Honestly, I can hardly believe how much you've done for me. I do appreciate it, but still, the length you've gone to. Achi looked at his feet, then drew himself up. Well, I admit it's not just because of some gut instinct. Or, or your love for the environment, he said. There's another reason I'm doing this. There is? Achi paused, searching for the right words. I've got a little sister. Her name's Suzune. She's cute and smart. Kind of the exact opposite of me, you know. His voice took on an uncharacteristic solemnity. But she's got a weak heart, so she's in the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But what does that have to do with wanting to help me? Back when Suzune was first admitted, I would go and visit her every day. But she... Hachi, you don't need to come visit me every day, you know. The quiet hospital room made Suzune's voice sound all the more frail. What are you talking about, Achi said. You know I'm wor you know I'm worried about you. I'll be fine on my own, really. Achi had heard that line before. The more she insisted she was fine though, the more reluctant she was to leave her. Besides, aren't you the amazing guy who helped hold Shibuya together? They need you out there. Achi didn't know how to respond to that. Much as it was flattering to think he played some important role, he was really just hanging out and goofing off with his pals. It certainly wasn't anything for his sister to be proud of. I'd rather you spend your energy helping people who need it more than me. What do you mean? People who need... What do you mean people who need the, the help? What do you mean people who need the help more? Who could possibly need help right now more than you? Achi scratched his head in confusion and his sister gave him a weak, tiny smile. You'll figure it out, she said. I'm sure they'll find you soon enough. But I'm gonna be here with you. I'll be fine. Suzune's, gave, Suzune's face was pale but her tone was firm. My big brother is gonna be out there doing his best to help people. That's what makes me happy. That's what makes me happy. That's what keeps me going. Her voice was clear and unwavering as if to head off his rebuttal. All right, as she said with a reluctant sigh. So then I guess like I'll just go out there and help people who are in trouble. Satisfied, Suzune smiled. <laughs> Thank you. And can you promise me one more thing? Of course. Anything you like. He thumped himself in the chest. If you're going to help someone, make sure you see it all the way through to the end, okay? Okay. No calling quits part way through. Okay? You got it. No calling quits part way through. I just worry. Suzuni said. I know you have a tendency to use interesting things. Look, don't sweat it. I swear I won't give up on this. Achi stuck out his pinky finger. But I want you to promise me something in return. Pinky swear to me you won't let this thing beat you. Suzune hooked her little finger around her brothers and her sad smile fragile as a glass. And so there you have it, Achi said. Kind of a rubbish story, I know. Not very funny. So your sister's heart condition is pretty bad? Achi nodded. You know, she... She called me amazing. There's nothing amazing about me. Suzune, she's the amazing one. She's been in hospital so long, in so much pain, but she never complains. All I do is hang out and goof off with my friends. He gave a shrug. 
But I just kept thinking about how happy she would be if I really did have people. Yeah, it turned out that finding people in need hadn't been all that simple. The only helpful thing that she had been able to think of was going around picking up trash. And that's why Suzune's idiot brother left SOS to be Shibuya's garbage man. Did your friends know? He told me ask. About your sister? I didn't tell him. I didn't want to pin this all on her being sick. Oh, I see. At least now he told me understood what the fight with the local tough tough local toughs. What is that a word, toughs? It's an adjective, it's not a noun. Tugs? Okay. At least now he told me understood what the fight with the local toughs have been about. The sound of approaching footsteps jerked them back into the present. Him again! The man with a cane appeared at the end of the alley and raised his gun. There was no time to flee. Achi quickly stepped in front of Itomi. If you shoot us here, people are going to come running, he said. I'm guessing you don't want to get pegged for murder. The assassin didn't flinch. Stay out of my way, Achi. This time there was no doubt. The gunman had spoken that she's name loud and clear. How do you know who I am? The man stared at him through the side of his gun. She has to die, Achi. It's for your own good. What? What does he mean? He told me he whispered. Achi, what is he talking about? Achi's mind was a world. Things were coming at him too fast for him to process. I don't know this guy. He told me, please, you have to believe me. But... He told me to come down full step away from Achi. The assassin didn't miss his opening. He quickly aimed at her. Cut the crap, man! What do you mean killing her is my, for my own good? Once she's dead, you'll understand. The gunman's finger tightened on the trigger. To be continued. To be continued, damn it. Of course. Off freaking course. All right. So, who's next? Minorikawa. Yeah, I remember that uh, you were left. We were almost finished because uh, you had one. Yeah, let's forget the jump this time. You interviewed one person. She said that you, she, she was a cat and that you left her there. What the hell is wrong with you? Was this here a cat? No, uh, no, I mean, yes, there was a person in a cat costume. I thought since I couldn't see their face, it'd be easier to ask them stuff. Fine, whatever. Now get back out there and get me some more. Minorikawa stared Chiaki towards the fasic. Ah, uh, now the, the kids are pointing, are, are mimicking the Minorikawa. Like they're, they're doing just like him. Pointing the finger. Minorikawa stared Chiaki toward the passing crowd. What now? Yes, now. We've got no time to waste. I'll even stand by and watch for a minute. Now enough. With the excuses and get out there. Mirikawa looked down as Shiaki wandered through the crowd. Her anxious demeanor seems to be repel everyone around her. On the rare chance she didn't manage to flag someone down, she weighed the way she stammered through their initial cash and make them take off right again. <laughs> made them take right off again. After a minute or two she shuffled her way back, shoulders lump slumped. See, it's hopeless. Okay, some advice. First off, you aren't approaching the right people. Some people are clearly in a rush, you know. You're not going to have much luck trying to flag down a businessman who's visibly in a hurry. Now, folks who are waiting on someone, couples, groups, they're going to be less on their guard. 
But I mean, if I don't do manage to nab someone, how do I keep the conversation going? Shaki asked. That was indeed the tricky. That was indeed the tricky part. Whenever I get an answer, I'm not expecting. Oh wait. Whenever I get an answer, I'm not expecting. I get all flustered. Shiaki, have you ever played tennis? Tennis? Um, well, yeah. I was in my school tennis club. She struck Mirikawa as being more the manga ta club type, but that was neither here nor there. Okay, that'll make this simpler. What's more fun, rallying with an opponent or hitting the ball off a wall? We're rallying with someone else, of course. Minarikawa gave a hearty nod. And why is that? Because when you hit the ball off a wall, you already know where it's going to come back to. Revelation dawned on Shiaki's face. Oh! It's the same with interviews, Minarikawa said. Don't get flustered, enjoy the rally. But I don't think I'm composed enough to enjoy it. Don't overtake things. Just let yourself enjoy the small talk. Small talk? Oh, I'm sure I'm not any good at that. She was starting to waffle again. Okay, so let me ask you this, Minorikawa said, taking a step closer. Are you happy with your life right now? I... I'm not happy with my life right now, no, Shaki muttered. She hung her head in dismay. Okay, so I'll start with that, Minorikawa said. Huh? Shiaki blinked a few times as she lifted her head back up. I'm not happy with my life right now, but what about you? Something like that. Oh, okay. A sliver of liveliness have crept back into Shiaki's voice. Minorikawa jabbed his finger right into her face. Right there, he said. Put on that face when you flag people down. Shiaki smiled widened. I'll give it a shot. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Good luck. Shiaki strolled enthusiastically into the crowd and tried to flag down a Westerner who was walking hurriedly past. That was Leland. That's Leland Palmer. Did she even listen to a word I said? Minorikawa felt his short-lived triumph melt away. Am I just going to have to teach her? Am I going to just have to teach her everything again from scratch? Then he paused in surprise. Hold on. Okay, good. He stopped and then she she's forcing on him. Okay, good. Whoa. Shiaki has snatched the man by the arm in an attempt to get him to stop. To Minorikawa's amazement, the gambit worked. Before long, it looked like the two were engaged in some kind of animated conversation. Maybe she would get an interview out of this after all. Heck, the look on her face was actually somewhat confident. Sometimes people should surpri could surprise you once you got past their surface issues. Now, Mirakawas could head to the Burning Hammer sales demo with more peace of mind. With more peace of mind. Speaking of which, crap! What time is it? I'm in a panic. Mirakawa, check his wristwatch. Think about this wristwatch. That will tell you how much you think about the opposite sex and whatnot. What? Okay, because it's almost one, it's like it's 12.56, but the way the needles are, are positioned, yeah, that will tell you how you think about the opposite sex. The demo was uh, to start in less than five minutes. Uh-oh! He really was cutting it close. I'm gonna be late! Minakawa sprinted through the intersection, heading for center guy. To be continued! Alright, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna continue with... Instead of jumping back with Kano... 
I'm gonna jump straight to Osawa because I haven't touched his story at all and I already finished Tama, Achi and Minorikawa. That ain't good. He's gotta be connected to someone somehow. Because all, all the, the relationship I got with him is a jump with Kano, I think. I need, to, I need to check my... Oh yeah, I got a bad end from Kano that, that is, hasn't been resolved. My bad end with Kano hasn't been resolved. So he's got to do something. Okay. The rain won't let up. No matter how much time passes, it just won't stop. Ever since that day, the sounds of raindrops have been burned into my mind. Such an awful art rendering sound driving me to strip my life down to shadows. And yet no matter what else I abandon, nothing will make the sound of the rain stop. Hmm. Looking at picture again, King Solomon's pliers. Osawa started at the postcard that was nestled into the final pages of the photo album. He had purchased it two years earlier while on a trip with Maria to the Middle East. Originally used in indicated, indicated Iran, Afghanistan, and the region surrounding them. In modern times, the term refers to part of southwestern Asia, including India and Afghanistan and the section of northeastern Africa along the Mediterranean coast. However, in Japan, as well as the U.S., the term Middle East is often understood to refer especially to those part of the region with strong Islamic influence. He had mentioned that he was being sent there on business, and Maria just blurted out, I want to go with you! She recently developed an interest in the Middle East conflict, and apparently she had been yearning to see the area firsthand. The ongoing friction in the Palestine region between the Jewish people who founded the nation of Israel and the Arabs who had been living there previously. The religious and historical context of this cultural clash is well beyond the scope of what can be elucidated here, of course. We're not gonna solve the, uh, the Palestinian, Israel, Israel Palestinian conflict here, in the folks. Too much politics! His daughter's newfound curiosity has taken it aback. She had always tended to be quiet and self-contained. The clumsy conversation about the, aboard, the, aboard the airplane, the meals eaten together in awkward silence, it all felt like such a distant memory to Asawa now. Ma'am, I'm afraid I can't let you do that. You heard Kajiwara's voice outside the door. Why ever not? I'm just going out for a bit. The detective was arguing with I. Great. And just who was it who told me I should try to go out about my life as noble? Hmm? Osawa's wife sneered. Ma'am, please, wait. How would you feel about being told to just sit around and wait? I's angry shriek jerked Osawa to his feet, eerie from the study to try to calm her down. Ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am, please wait. By the time Osawa had made his way downstairs, his wife has already stormed outside despite Kajiwara's attempt to stop her. Osawa doubted anything he could have said anything he could have said would have stopped Ai from leaving. Trying to physically keep her from going out would only have made for an even worse uproar. He was glad that at least he had come to that. He was turning to head back to the study when Kajiwara caught his eyes. Resigned, he headed down the stairs and bowed to the detective. So, um, any idea where she's going? Kajiwara asked. I mean, 
at a time like this. I saw what she said. I wouldn't know. I didn't think so. You know, your wife really is something else. Sawa Archinaibra. That's one way to describe her. A rather rude way, as a matter of fact. Oh, no offense intended. Uh, it's just that ever since this case started, you've both been holed up in your own respective rooms. The more Kajiwara spoke, the more irritated Osawa became. What's your point? He demanded. I just mean, you haven't been having any uh, marital discourse. According to one survey, in roughly 6% of households, discourse between spouses is largely non-existent. Various reasons for this were offer offered by the couples in question. Many claimed that they were too tired to have the energy to talk or stated we wind up fighting when we talk or we have nothing to talk about. Mind your own business, Osawa snapped. Kajiwara dipped his head differentially. The two of us, the two of us not talking isn't a new thing anyhow, Osawa added. I have a policy of not having pointless conversation. It is quite common for Kenji Osawa to make it to an entire day without having a single conversation. On many days, he opened his mouth only to eat or brush his teeth. His current record is a streak of 14 consecutive days during which he didn't talk to anyone. Wow. Huh. It didn't look as though Kajiwara quite understood. Microorganisms such as viruses don't have conversations, and yet still they continually propagate in order to survive. Thinking about viruses, Asawa was back in familiar territory and felt a surge of confidence. Once you have a clear purpose, conversation is unnecessary. And do you have a clear purpose for the relationship with your wife, Mr. Asawa? Of course I do. To be a family. Hmm. Arms crossed because you want to truck a thoughtful pose. At least I've learned one so useful thing today, Mr. Osawa, namely that you don't like to have pointless conversation. It's a good thing to know. Kajiwara uncrossed his arm for a moment, then crossed them right back again, furrowing his brow. But see, that's funny. You seem to have a tendency to have pointless conversation with me, and because you keep coming to talk to me. Osawa saw red. You don't leave me much of a choice. Tanaka poked his head out to the living room. Is something the matter? He asked. Uh, no. Osawa struggled to regain his calm. Uh, perfect timing, actually. There's something I need to talk to you about. He turned back to Kajiwara. My apologies, detective, but would you mind giving us some privacy? Kajiwara, Kajiwara didn't move. Detective? So I gave the policeman a hard look and saw him crack a smile. Yes? What is it? Kajiwara said at last. Don't you play dumb with me. Give us some privacy. Is this a discussion I shouldn't overhear? Actually, yes. It's work-related. There are business matters that I prefer to keep confidential. Ah, I see. Reluctantly getting to his feet, Kajiwawa slipped away into the living room. Tanaka, Osawa began. About those emails. He stopped abruptly. Kajiwawa, I reappeared in the living room door, staring right at them. What are you doing? Osawa demanded. Oh, um, should I not be watching? Osawa felt like he was about to burst a blood vessel. I mean... You never told me that I couldn't watch. 
because it should be obvious. The detective made a scalded, poppy face and closed the living room door. Osawa let out at his side. He'd never been an extrovert, but he didn't recall human interaction being quite this draining. Anyway, sir, Danica prompted, you were saying? Yes, about those emails. Something doesn't make sense. I don't understand how Mr. Machino was able to get the anti-viral agent to anyone on the outside. Sharing an Okoshi pharmaceutical drug with external sources while it was still under development required the approval of executive committee that included Osawa himself. There should have been no way the antiviral could be sent out without his knowledge. Tanaka is it a few moments before responding. Are you aware of the strife between the company president and the chairman? Osawa shook his head. He was a researcher through and through. Factional rivalry, rivalries held no interest for him whatsoever. Makino effectively, effectively leads the chairman's team and the antiviral agent is their pet project. Despite being the executive officer in charge of the project, however, Makino still needs the president's approval to... You know what? Forget about that right now. What do we do about security? In theory, it was physically impossible to get the antiviral out of the lab without detection. Entry to the biohazard laboratory where it was kept required fingerprint authentication from both Osawa and Tanaka. <coughs> yeah. Technology that allows individual identity to be verified by scanning the fingerprints. It is one element of it is one element of biometrics, the measurement of physical characteristics to identify individuals. There are even devices that can identify people by checking the veins in the palm of their hands or the irises of their eyes. Now we see a demonstration of the fingerprint authentication. Without the two of them there, nobody could even get into the storage facility. Because of dangerous virus is also stored here, the lab where the antiviral is kept protected by an ID checkpoint, as well as a sophisticated three-tiered lock system that requires fingerprint authentication, Multiple safeguards are also posted outside the laboratory entrance 24 hours a day, making it all but impossible for an unauthorized person to get into the secured storage area. Tanaka follows his shift. His drift. Ah, yes, I see what you mean. He inclined his head in, in, do, in, do, uh, in thought as Osawa continued. Hey, could someone has overwritten the fingerprints identification program? Let's check the entry logs for the storage section. We'll just have to ask Makino in person. Uh, I want to check the entry logs. Let's check the entry logs for the storage section. Anyone who wanted to get inside had to present their ID cards to the security guard on duty. It should be possible to check the computer logs to see if there had been any suspicious activity in the system. Tanaka shook his head. I already checked the logs, sir. There was no evidence of anything suspicious. We are welcome to check for yourself, though, if, if you're that worried. No, I believe you. Yet the fact was that the antiviral had been used for clinical testing. Either Makino had taken it from the laboratory personally, or someone working on his orders had done so. But how? Was there really some way they could have bypassed law security without anyone else knowing? Osawa couldn't think how it would be possible. <clears throat> the living room door opened with a soft creak. It was Kajirawa and he looked stiff and pale. Something terrible has happened, he said. Vision of tragedy flooded Osawa's mind. Maria! Maria, is she... Maria, is she... Kashiwara shook his head. No, no, it's not that. What is it then? Osawa asked, his voice trembling. Sir, I, I need you to stay calm. Osawa swallowed the lump in his throat. You see... The toilet's clogged. Fake tension. Plunger in hand, Osawa stabbed vigorously at the recalcitrant toilet bowl, struggling to loosen the unseen blockage. Uh, 
Makes a variety of sounds when used, such as glub, glork, schlock, slorp, schloop, and pop. Kajiwara was as its side, wiping up the floor with a rag. How did this... How did this even happen? The detective groaned. Are you kidding? I was hoping you could tell me that. The plunger sucked and slurped at the porcelain basin. This was a first for Sawa. He never tried to unclog a toilet before in his life. Think of it as a blessing in disguise, Mr. Owara. What the hell are you talking about? What about this constitutional blessing? I just meant that at least this happened before you needed to uh, do your business. Without the slightest hint of guile on his face, Kajiwara picked up his bucket and headed for the sink back in the washing area. Grumbling to himself, Osawa pumped the plunger over and over again. This was almost funny. Almost ridiculous, in fact. His daughter had been kidnapped and he was stuck on clogging a toilet. He was quite possibly caught up in a major corporate conspiracy and here he was on clogging a toilet. <laughs> Tanaka poked his head into the bathroom. Did you fix it yet? If you need to urinate, then use the restroom on the second floor. That's alright, it's fine. That's all right, here is fine. Tanaka stepped in beside him and abruptly shut the bathroom door. What the fuck is wrong with him? He gets too, too close to him. He gets very, very too close to him. Now the two men were crammed together in a narrow lavatory. Hey! Osawa hissed. What the hell are you doing? Tanaka made eye contact with Osawa via the mirror. He spoke in a hushed voice. I've been waiting for a moment I could get you alone. What? Tanaka siddle uh, around to face him, giving him an intense stare. Shh. Sir, could you please be quiet for a moment? Tanaka had tears in the corner of his eyes. This will only take a moment. Osawa could feel the warm breath of his deputy whispering against his cheek. Tanaka reached for something inside his coat. Hey, come now, knock it off. Osawa lifted the plunger like a weapon. Look, if there you want to talk, we can do it out here there. Osaka shoved Tanaka out the bathroom. All right, do as you wish. Osawa closed his eyes. All right, lift the plunger like a weapon. Hey, come on, knock it off. Osawa lifted the plunger like a weapon. Quiet. Tanaka cheated again, taking out a cell phone. Here. Take a look at this. Huh? Osawa could never anticipate what he saw on the LCD screen. Keep out? Oh yeah, the keep out! Oh, that was where back when... Uh, um, shit, what's her name? He told me he texted... Uh, he told me he texted uh, Tanaka. Yeah, is that this jump? Which jump was it? No, this is uh, with Taka. Okay, this jump? Yeah, father, the father jump. Here you go. Do we begin typing like a response? Actually, watch over the right speculation through his mind. There was no mere my mother, a young man like her, with David Ng, one of her father's co workers. There you go. Let's. Rig the keep out. Boom. Here, take a look at this. Huh? Well, so I could never anticipate what he saw on the LCD screen. It was an email from Itomi. Stifling an exclamation, he scanned the contents of the message. There's a man following me. He has a gun and I think he's trying to kill me. I'm safe for the moment, so try not to worry. The kidnapper warned me, to, told me not to contact my family or the police. Please keep this email a secret. But, 
But didn't Tommy give the kidnapper the ransom? Osawa said. What could anyone want with her want now? Tanaka shook his head uncertain. He wouldn't know any better than I would, I suppose. Do the police know about this? And if so, why haven't they said anything? He felt himself start to tremble as he searched for and saw in Tanaka's silent gaze. Do, do you think this could be related to that other thing? I doubt it. If it were, why would it go after it told me? I suppose you're right, but... Osawa was shaking out right now. Tanaka laid a hand on his shoulder. First, just calm down and let's think about what we know about the kidnapper. His composure helped Osaka keep himself under control. They've taken Maria, the vice director continued quietly. Along with a ransom of 50 million yen. And now they're after Itomi. His gaze sharpened. Sir, do you think this could be someone who holds a personal grudge against you? A grudge? Osawa considered. He couldn't think of anyone who could have a reason to attack him. He had been too caught up in the virus research since his, uh, since his time in school to have formed any hostile rivalries. He didn't have any enemies that he knew of. Maybe someone jealous that I became head of a laboratory, he suggested doubtfully. He had held this position for years at this point. Why would that be spur someone into kidnapping his daughter now? Has anything happened recently? Tanaka asked. Anything strange since you got back from overseas? Since I got back? Osawa's heart skipped a beat, then stairs started pumping faster. The first thing that came to mind was the solicitation he'd gotten from the American laboratory. If he accepted the offer, it would put Okushi Pharmaceutical in quite a bind. Possibly enough to warrant someone holding a grudge over it. But the only other person who knew about this potential transfer right now was his wife, I. No, Osawa said. Nothing. Not that I can think of. He couldn't bring himself to discuss a transfer with Tanaka. He felt a surge of guilt for contemplating leaving his trusted assistant behind. If he didn't make to move, if he didn't make the move to America, he planned to recommend that Tanaka replace him as department director. Still, he didn't expect that to make up for his abandonment. <coughs> All right, I'll see what information I can find then, Tanaka said. The kidnapper had forbidden any contact with either family or the police. But Tanaka was outside of that circle, and he knew how to handle himself with discretion. I'm sorry to have put this on you. Oh, I'm sorry to have put this on you, Osaka said, and thank you. For now, let's see if we can get Itomi to exchange some more emails. An uncomfortable thought suddenly occurred to Osawa. He blurted out without thinking. Why do you have my daughter's contact information on your phone? Then I gotta give him a worried look. Sir, I promise I can explain once all this is over. And with that, he stepped out of the bathroom. Something in the tone of his final word left Osawa to wonder. Could it be that Tanaka and Itomi were dating? He hoped dearly for that not to be the case. Their age difference alone makes the idea a disturbing one, let alone so many other considerations. Mamoru Tanaka is 40 years old. Itomi is 19. This makes him just over twice her age. This does not necessarily mean, however, that they could not date or fall for each other. Many couples with such an age difference between them wind up in a happy, committed relationship. Try to put aside his paranoia, Asawa resumes his struggle with a clog in the toilet. Most toilet clogs are caused by a buildup of flushable paper products or by a solid object inadvertently dropped in the toilet bowl. But shockingly enough, on very rare occasions, they can be caused by someone taking a dump that happens to be that big and it gets stuck in the pipe. Apologies to anyone who might be eating right now. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh goodness. Kajiwa reappears, still toting the bucket. You seem to be having a lot of trouble there, sir. He made it sound like the whole mess was Osawa's fault. Of course I am. I've never had to do this before. Really? 
I think the research you do could... I, th I would think the research you do would be a lot more difficult than this. Fixing toilet gives me far more trouble, I'd say. So it would seem. Kajiwara stood watching as if a sour effort made an instant interesting show. I don't know the first thing about viruses, sir. But I don't find unclogging the toilet to be that difficult. Oh yeah? Osawa snapped. Then how about you fix the damn thing? Kajiwara really was a world-class pro at pissing people off. Are you sure? You don't mind? The detective asked. Be my goddamn guest! Osawa shoved the plunger into Kajiwara's hand. Leaving the detective to handle the toilet, Osawa marched back to his study. He turned on the CD player and lay back on the sofa, squeezing his eyes shut. He was seriously on edge. Kajiwara had totally broken his stride. What now? The door to the study slid slowly open. It's Detective Kajiwara, sir. Please don't come in here without asking. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Osawa. I just wanted to inform you that the toilet has been fixed. Right. Fine. Osawa hardly cared. He just wanted this guy to give him a little peace. Oh my, is that really all you have to say, sir? Nary a compliment or encouraging, or encouraging word? Maybe a good job, Kajiwara, or you're getting a promotion, detective. Osawa blew out of his breath in exasperation. How? How are you a detective? I'm uh, not sure I get your meaning, sir. You are completely clueless. I, I'd, I'd like to ask your superior to replace you with a detective who knows how to take his job seriously. Oh, Mr. Osawa, uh, with all due respect, uh, it's unusual for a precinct detective like me to be stationed here at the victim's home. What's your point? Uh, not to brag, sir, but I happen to be an exceptional detective. Kajiwara beamed with pride. In fact, I made an excellent showing in the Superstar Detective Contest we had on the police social media service. For a moment, I saw I thought the bolt of incredulous anger that shot through him was the onset of a stroke. How could a single person be so utterly infuriating? And you can't tell anyone about this, Fujiwara went obviously, but this summer, a new detective manga is starting, is, star, is, is starting up based on me. Plan for serialization in MPD's monthly PR magazine. The fable titles have already been decided. Chapter 1, The Fable Detective Kaji. Chapter 2, Kaji Halls at the Sun. Chapter 3, Kaji Rides the Rails. Chapter 4, Kaji at Daybreak. Chapter 5, Detective Kajak. Chapter 6, Kaji Queen of the Street. Detective Chapter 7, Look Out Kaji. Chapter 8, Kaji on the Edge. Chapter 9, Dance Kaji Dance. Chapter 10, Space Detective Kaji, and so forth and so on. Fuck! Osawa spat on the, uh, out a peal of feigned laughter. A manga? I can tell you all about the plot, sir. Would you like to hear about it? I would not. It's about a telecommunity detective who solved major crimes using just his wits and his computer. Surely you'd like to hear about that, sir. I really wouldn't. I know you may not look at it, but I'm pretty handy with computers. Kajiwara's eyes drift over to Osawa's desktop. His hand darted to the mouse. In a matter of moment, he cleared the screensaver and booted up a web browser. He's still wearing his, his uh, rubber gloves and they're dripping with water. And he just put this, that on top of his hand, Osawa's hands, and uh, Osawa's mouse. Hey! Osawa barked. Don't judge that! But it was too late to stop the detective. Aya Kamiki. The monitor showed the page for Ayanet, a fan page devoted to Aya Kamiki. Osawa's imminent rage stroke was beginning to make it this version grow fuzzy. You... You come to this site regularly, sir. 
regularly. Uh, well, I'm not sure I'd, um, uh... I saw what trailed off, feeling the heat of a blush flare on his cheeks. There's a lot of su stuff on his side. Is there a section you finally spend time on? Well, I mean, for my part, I, uh... I really only go to the fan forums for folks 40 and over. Aha! With a twinkle of curiosity, with his eyes, Sketchy would appear at his computer screen. Having his privacy invaded to this degree wasn't the ultimate disgrace. All right, Osawa Huff. You're an amazing detective, Kajuara. Just incredible. I see you in a new light now. Now would you please get the hell out of my room? He tried to usher Kajuara back. Please leave me alone. Get the hell out of my room! He tried to usher Kajuara back out the door. All right, sir, the detective said. All right, I understand. I'll leave. But before that, Kajuara slipped his hand into his pocket. I I don't need a damn banana. It's not that, Mr. Osawa. I have something I think may be important to you. He held out a small plastic bag. Inside was a scrap of paper of some sort. What's that? Osawa asked. This is what's clogging the toilet, sir. With some hesitation, Asawa took a hold of the bag. Huh? That's... The passenger name here listed as Kenji Osawa. In the plastic bag was a plane ticket, specifically the one for his upcoming flight to the US the following week. He'd left it out on his desk. How oh, had it wound up being flushed down the toilet? This looks like it's pretty important, sir, Kajuara said. I must say it was pretty careless of you for ax to accidentally flush it. A wry sort of smile came to his face. Although, the detective added, I suppose the question of who flushed it is another matter entirely. Osawa was at a loss for words. Someone had tried to flush his plane ticket on purpose. He was sure of it. He knocked on the door to Ai's room, but there was no response. It didn't look like she'd gotten back home yet. Osawa let himself in. The stinging scent of a perfume pervaded the room, which was decorated all in white. Clothes were strewn all about as if to put her slovenliness, slovenliness on display. She's been like this ever since they gotten married, and Osawa had long since stopped caring. Ah, uh, it must have been Ai who would try to flush the ticket. He knew she didn't want him going to America, but still, couldn't she have found a better way to get rid of it? Thanks to her, He'd been stuck hunched over the damn toilet, fighting with the plunger. Osawa sat down on the bed and missed the brand name clothing. Then he spotted something odd down by his feet. It was a good it was a gold cigarette lighter. Just when at Hyde pick up something like that. Osawa picked up the lighter and set it on the shelf next to the bed. He started out the room, but stopped as, she no as he noticed a scrapbook on the bookshelf. The rest of the shelf was filed with fashion magazines, so the scrapbook is definitely drew his eyes. Curious, he, at, he took it down and opened it. The book was filled with articles and write-ups about the results of Osawa's research and the company's various achievements. Flipping through the pages took him on a trip down memory lane. There was even an old company memo welcoming Tanaka on board as his new vice director. There was a photo of Asawa shaking Tanaka's hands at the party celebrating his new position. It was a little peculiar to think that she had bothered to keep something so trivial. A series of magazine articles was nestled between the pages of f further into the book. There hadn't been clip up for inclusion in the scrapbook itself. Asawa glanced through them. Floundering Okushi Pharmaceutical arranges marriages of political convenience. It was a self-indulgent piece for some rag called Four Star General Gossip from right after he and I had gotten married. When the piece had first run, it'd been too furious to read it. 
now he gave it a quick look over it was pretty much exactly what he expected <coughs> it talked about how one of the corporate director had sacrificed his own daughter in order to keep one of the researcher on board sacrifice allowing someone else to come to harm for one personal gain in this case the term is used figuratively not literally <coughs> referring to of course to Makino offering Osawa's eye, Osawa eyes and in marriage rumor abound of marsh marital strife between the newlyweds the article went out to talk about how how I and had been dating another man before she and Osawa had gotten married the whole thing was a bunch of pure rubbish. Any marriage involves some kind of calculated self-interest after all. Whatever the reason for their union, nothing changed the fact that Ai was now his wife. With a faint sigh, Osawa put the scrapbook back on the shelf. Feeling disconsolate, he returned to his study and began flipping through his CD crack. His eyes scanned for Aya Kamiki's album for tomorrow forevermore. A lot of her more experimental numbers were on that album. Given how discombobulated he felt right now, this was what he needed to hear. Again, Osawa reflected on how there has been a time where he didn't care about music at all. He'd simply purchased copy of the most popular CD of the moment uh, as birthday present for his two girls. And that uh, just happened to be an album of, uh, by Aya Kamiki. He told me he was thrilled by the gift, but Maria hadn't seemed terribly fond of it. The next day, she tossed her copy back on the father's desk, figuring that throwing it away would be a waste. Osawa had stuck the CD into his computer to give it a listen. He was immediately bombarded by an intense beat bolstered by bold, uplifting vocals. Aya Kamiki wrote her own lyrics, which did a fine job of conveying the emotion of a teenage girl. Osawa could hardly believe it. After listening to just one track, he was well, he was well and truly hooked. Before the day was out, he had purchased her entire discography. Well, 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 huh? He muttered, for tomorrow should have been in the CD rack, but there was no sign of it. Where the heck is it? Why isn't it here? For a moment, he wondered if he was going crazy, and then he remembered. It was at the lab. He wanted something to listen to on break at work, so he brought the album there. Damn it, damn it, damn it. No, being able to listen to it well, made him want to hear it all the more. It wasn't like he could just go out and buy another copy right now either. He just had to borrow the copy. Give it. <coughs> Sorry about that. He would just have to borrow the copy he'd given to Itomi all those years ago. Unable to contain his need to hear that music, he went into Itomi's room. There, he quickly rummaged through the CD rack beside his daughter's bed. Part of him felt like he was being a little sneak thief. According to the email Tanaka had shown him, someone was trying to kill Itomi. Under the circumstances, he knew that what he was doing was ridiculous, and yet he still couldn't resist the impulse of finding his CD. But his efforts were to no avail. There were no Ak Ayakimi Kamiki CDs in the rack at all. Mozart, Dvorak. Uh, what's this? Symphony number no. 9 in D minor. Osawa pulled over every CD on the rack, but they were all classical music. He slumped back in disappointed. It has to be somewhere in her room. <coughs> Osawa jumped at the sound of his cell and fumbled to get it out of his pocket. <coughs> Makino's name was displayed on the LCD screen. I'm, I'm up front. That was all Makino said before hanging up. Hurry, hurriedly, Osawa began tidying up the CD rack. As he worked it through about what he was going to say to Makino, to think that someone had violated corporate policy to such unethical ends. It sullied his research, so Sawa wasn't about to let anyone get away with it. And yet, as he was about to leave Itomi's room, a sudden uncertainty gripped him. He hesitated. Did he have any right to condemn Makino for running trials in secret? His hand had began to sweat as it gripped the doorknob. No, he didn't. How could he? His hands were dirty in all this too.
We need to keep this a secret just between us. Ejection, it'll be fine. We already clear animal testing. The memory is hovered. Osawa himself had already administered the antiviral to someone, hasn't he? It was, it was the only way. Muttering to nobody in particular, Osawa trudged toward the front door of his house. To be continued? That was it? One jump. No uh, bad, uh, bad end on his part. All my decisions seems pretty obvious. So, all right. So... How do I get rid of that bad end? I have to read this again. The pincer attack. Two detectives took up position upside side of the plaza. Kanoka Sasayama, you're ready, just get the words. It's about to take place and then, well, 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 if it isn't Mr. Toyama. No, it's still there. It's still there. I changed my decision, but it's still there. You know what? Where did Tama bump into that guy? Here? No, here. At 12.15. At what time did Minorikawa told him to... Uh, after? No, that's the weird sound. Advice for Toyama at 1235. I don't get it at all. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, try again to back to the office. Back to the office. Save. Okay. Okay, that didn't change Mirikawa, but that didn't change the bad ending either. What happened here? Back to the precinct. Kano was taking off the case because he lost track of the suspect thanks to a random attention and by this glimpse conclusion was correct. If that father-daughter dude wasn't showed up, this wouldn't happen. A certain someone needs to give those two better advice. And a certain other someone needs to meet up with them outside his of her house. These guys need to meet. Oh, okay. So, it, it, it needs two actions of two different people, but I don't know which ones. And... Yeah, I have one. I got one hour to figure this out. Who can meet up with them? I do not get it. Mm. 
Buying time. They meet up the bloody young man at 1235. They were probably guillotine. I think that that was it. This was the, the guy that been getting by Koji because this happened at 1225. Pursued by the assassin. Did he say my name? Man with King, persistent pursuit. The job. This is gonna be more difficult by the minute. A voice by the station. This was a... Uh... That's weird. Cause there 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 are many choice there's many choice in the Sawa's timeline, but they, they look like insignificant. I don't know what they could do. What could he say that could force a meeting? So this is good. I'm on B, right? Just want to make sure. This one, I'm on B. Yeah, I need to go back to the office. Yeah, that, that was it. Sorry, I need to go to the bathroom real quick. Be right back.
trigger the the removal of the bad ending I'm gonna read carefully just to be sure Keanu was taking out the case because of his Identification is gun conclusion was correct. If the father of the girl hasn't showed up, it's gonna happen. So then someone needs to give those two better advice. I said, How does someone need to meet up with them outside his or her house? Meet them outside their house. I believe it has something to do with some, but something before. But I don't think that's something before. Uh, something that happened before is gonna trigger. Uh, Lab security. I'm gonna try this. See what's gonna happen. Tanaka follow his drift. Yeah, I see what you mean. He finds his head. Uh, we just have to ask Makino in person. The fact that the antiviral has been used for clinical testing, either Makino had taken it from the laboratory personally or someone working on his own done so. Oh, it was already, uh, wait. That didn't change anything. Nah, it didn't. All right, by process of elim elimination, if I start at 12 here, this one has a purpose. We got to keep them in the restaurant. Here. Annoyed by the weird sound that triggers a bad ending, but that's not that not relevant I think and then this is advice so yeah tw uh, it has to be before 1240. Try with her. I think this is it. I'm gonna try. This girl is kind of creeping me out. I decide to ignore her and move along. I'll see. If, maybe it's gonna move something. This girl is kind of creeping me out. I decide to ignore her and move along. She refused to back down, however. Ah! Hey, wait! Please! Please, please! She's begging up right now. She's got tears in her eyes. I really am super busy. Just one, please. Can you just just one question? 
People are shooting out their weird looks as they walk by. Maybe it would be simpler to just answer the question and I'll go down as quick as I can. Alright, go ahead, I say. Alright, uh, so are you happy with your life right now? Right now? As you can see, I'm a cat. Oh, a cat. Yeah, I see a cat. So, um, yeah, I'll put on cat. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, uh, sure. Later. Did that do anything? No. What about this? Search. No, this has its purpose. This has its purpose, so it's not her. How about Achi? What's his relation with the... I have no idea why. Let me think, let me think, let me think, let me think. The blue mini van arrives. This is 11.50. Here. He told me his reservation. Yeah, that triggers a jump. Here, SOS spring around. If I do that 1210. Hmm. I don't think the the Yakuza are related. Hmm, this is gonna be tougher than I imagine. I think I have to save, since it's, it's already saved, I think I have to stop it there since I have, uh, 
something at nine. And it's gonna be too short. Alright, let's try and break everything, see if it works. That's the only thing I can think of. Alright, so here, buying time. The real case has already been switched out. The real case already switched out. It made a certain amount of sense. By handing the case off to some accomplice after another, they were leading the detective to pay more attention to the individual than the case itself. That could enable them to swap the case while all the focus was elsewhere. Kano shared his hunch with Sasayama. Hmm, I see. I mean, it is a possibility. Y yeah, we might be following the wrong case. There was palpable tension in the air now. Kano, you gotta report it to Kuze. On it! Kano's hands flashed on his wireless, but Kuze was dismissive. No, that is the case, I assure you. No offense, sir, but how can you be so sure? Kuze sighed. Because that's my job. There's an ID tag in that case that allows us to keep tabs on it. There's no way these crooks could have wiped off the do a duplicate. I uh, whipped up a duplicate. ID tag? What ID tag? Wait, no, that's right. Kano had forgot all about that detail in the wake of his all nighter. All right, right, right. Oh, don't you all right me? Clearly, you weren't hired for your brains. Focus on what you're good at. Who's the end of the call? Still, Kano couldn't shake his conviction that something was off. Man, with the attaché case, made switch to Shibuya Station. All right, so that didn't move. Okay. What about this? Bloody young man. Yeah, let's see uh, if uh, this is gonna make move somebody. They were in the middle of a job, but they couldn't just leave it like this. They should probably take him to hospital. Kano offered to help carry the bloody young man, but Sasayama stepped in front of him. He quickly flashed the two his badge. Oh crap, you're a cop? Sasayama nodded. Who you kids with? Bam! SOS? SOS. Admitted one of the young men after some hesitation. Who attacked you? Yo, it ain't like that. What was it like? In fighting? The young man was silent. Uh, of course, yeah, I picked up like a street gun. So sh 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 blah, 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 blah. Don't worry, I got it. This hospital just down that way. Hurry up and get in there. I guess there's another version version breaking up while this infighting, blah blah blah. Yeah. Alright, the details were to catch up with the man they were tailing. Alright, so this is safe. What change? Still the bad end. Yeah. So it's not on Kano's side. I'm gonna try. Oh, too too early, too early. Uh, 11:25. Yeah, here. Lab security. I'm gonna try this again. It's gonna lead back to Makino, you know, that's for sure. Tanaka follows drift. Ah, yes, I see what you mean. He's a client of Torosawa. Could someone else over the finger trust on the explication program? Maybe whoever was behind the secret trials have reprogrammed the, the entry criteria while Osawa, while Osawa was overseas. That would allow them to gain access to storage facility without Osawa being there. But that would only be possible if they had Tanaka's cooperation. Tanaka's eyes wide and open when Osawa shares his conjecture. Sir, he asked, you don't think I was part of this, do you? Of course not. I was merely suggesting the possibility. The possibility is zero, Tanaka said. Making any changes to the system requires consent from the board, including your own personal approval, sir. Ah, oh, yes, you're right, of course. I certainly didn't mean to imply. I certainly didn't mean to imply anything. Osawa winks apologetically. Oh, 
So that didn't move. Later on, yeah, the whispering. Come knock it off, look for an attack, we can do it out there. Alright, do as you wish. Close his, Asawa close his eyes. Alright, do as you wish. Close his eyes. Are you sure you're ready for this? I'm not sure. This is all happening pretty fast. To be honest, I'm rather nervous. I understand, sir. I mean, now that I think of it, we do spend day in and day out in that lab together. I suppose this was bound to happen sooner or later. Sir, could you please open your eyes? I would like you to look at this. You'll have to forgive me. This is all a bit sudden. Please, sir, take a look. I... Uh, no, I can't. It's just the two of us. It's probably going to shock you, I know, but please, just look. Is it... Is it really that shocking? Oh, yes. Very. Now, please, open your eyes. Okay. No! I can't. Sir, trust me. This isn't easy for me either. Alright. Alright. Oh, it's not your dick, thank God. <laughs> Take a look at this. It's an email from Yutomi. Insufferable Kajiwara. Yeah, I'm gonna try this, move this, see if it works. Please leave me alone. Now, would you please, please leave me alone? He got up to leave the study. Sir! Oh, uh, wait, so it's wrong, so wrong voice. It's, uh, Sir, oh, sir, hold on. Sir, there's something I wanted to give you. Can you want to reach out this pocket? I don't need a damn banana. Oh, but if he does that, he'll never get the ticket. So I fled the room and he needed to be alone, if only for a few moments. But even if he could somehow shake Kajiwara, the other detective has eyes all over his house. He had reached the limit of his patience, could couldn't even think straight anymore. He headed for the back door, trying to avoid the police. Opening the door quietly, he slipped across the yard and out through the back fence. He didn't want to venture too far from the house. He found a tiny alley into cover there, thankful for, free, for a few moments for himself at last. Well, there he caught sight of a man and a young girl. Oh! Is that the right thing to do? Side of the right man, a young girl further his daughter running past on the main road. It looked as if they were running from something. A man glanced, glanced anxiously back over his shoulder, dragging his daughter by the hand. We saw her watch absently as the pair rounded the corner and disappeared from sight. Not long after, a pair of thuggish looking men came running along, heading in the same direction. You there! One of them called out! You see a guy and his daughter around here? This is a jump for, for Midorikawa. Teru, Toyama and his daughter Hana, they have come to Shoto while running from loan charge just a moment ago. Toyama was heading on the phone, talking on the phone with Midorikawa. It would work, but I don't need that. They should come by this way. There was a hint of menace in his voice. A, a sour faint in the rinse. Don't think so, no. Come on, Yutaro, let's go, said the older man. All right, replied the other. The other dashed off in some direction. The father and daughter had gone. Sawa took several long deep breaths and managed to calm down slightly, but the worry gnawing away his inside still lingered.
Osawa groaned inwardly when he got back to his study. You're still here? Yes, sir. I was told to keep my eyes on you after all. Believe me, it shows. Mr. Osawa, if you're going to go outside, I'd appreciate it if you let me know first. What? Ad Kashiwa realized he snuck out of the house. More importantly, reach back to his suit pocket. All right, this is the thing with the, the plane ticket. All right, so this is the right decision after all. I needed to get some, I get out of the house to get some fresh air for a moment. Does that do it? No. Because... What's the good decision here? Keep your head down, stay out of trouble. I'll try the jump this time. The man flashed to look back over his shoulder, took his daughter by the hand, pulled her off the roll, they crouched behind some bushes hiding. As he looked around wide eye wild eye, he spotted Osawa watching him from the alleyway. Help! the man called out. Help me! Please! If these guys catch me, I Oh! The father's eyes went wide that he got to look at Osawa's face. You you're Huh? Osawa thought he recognized this fugitive too, though he couldn't remember from where. There are some there are some real nasty guys after us, the man says. I know I have no right to ask you this, but please at least let me keep my daughter safe. Probably you should go to the police if No! They won't be able to help me with this. Please, I'm begging you, help me. I I'm sorry, but Please, if not me, at least help my daughter, the man pleaded. Osawa looked down at the girl. Oh, she a sad puppy face. Unlike her father, she was calm and reserved. She reminded him of Maria just a little. These people need professional help. Osawa decided to call the police. Osawa just couldn't just stand idly by. He decided to help them evade the pursuer. All right. Let's try this. Decide to help them invade their pursuers. All right, follow me. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. He led the two back to his house and into the storage shed out the back. You can lay low in here for a while if you like, he said. The shed was fairly large. There was plenty of space for the man and his daughter. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure I can possibly take you. Don't worry, Osaka closed the shed door and headed back to take a look around. Two thuggish lookish men came running around to him. No doubt there were people the father and daughter were running from. You there, said the one. You see a guy and daughter around here? They should have come this way. There was a hint of menace in his voice. A man and his daughter. Oh, yes, I think I saw them through here. Which way did they go? Daughter way. Sweet, we almost got him. The pair sped away. That's how I waited until they were fully out of sight. They called it to the shed. Alright, they're gone. 
door stay closed however i'm really sorry the man called back up from his side those guys might come back this way is it okay if we are out here a little while longer you sound desperate pitiful really sure go ahead or so i said with that he headed back inside evidently he just wasn't going to get anything anytime alone today no matter where he went all right now it's safe should be done now That should do it. Yeah, that was it. I need a. Uh, I don't really need a jump here, but because I didn't do it in that specific order. Oh wait, but now that's gonna trigger. Uh, that sh that changed my timeline, so I have to get through this until I get the 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 the, the to be continued. Auto play. So to keep my eyes on you, but it made shows. Hmm. I wonder if it's just faster if I just mash X. Except this part. Sorry.
Okay, now I see that's a vial of uh, liquid, translucent, probably the entire barrel of team. Uh, it was ejected on, on the neck of some girl, I don't know which one exactly. Like the, the, the image I see now like makes more sense because uh, they were like appearing when I was too focused on, on the on reading is like I didn't pay attention on like what's appearing on the, the screen it was like what so apparently Asawa was aware and he that he uh, made uh, that he uh, did a, a, a test trial on uh, on a human and he was in on it but it was not um, it was on someone who was um, someone who was not sick for some reason. I don't know why. All right, back to now. I finish uh, Ozawa's ending. All right, now Kano, the bad ending is off. Pincer attack. All right, the coast is clear. Not gonna have the. To, to, to position, Kano calls a Sayama. You're ready, just get a word. There are only two non Japanese people in the surrounding. Kano was certain the handoff was about to take place, and sure enough, there's a guy with a mustache and long hair. It looks like uh, he's from a metal band or is like a, a, a metal music aficionado. The second man approached the, the one holding the attache case. After exchanging a scant handful, a scant handful, handful of words, he took the case and walked off. Sasayama! I'll handle the guy with the case. Got it! Sasayama broke into a run, chasing after the man who'd taken the ransom. Kano hung up his phone and rushed to close the distance with the other man. You there! Stop where you are! The suspect turned and Kano re recognized his face. It was indeed a member of the foreign crime syndicate that operated in Shibuya. Is Yastas safe? Is Yastas safe? Kano demanded. The man's only response was an unsettling grin. Answer me! But, he, but though he repeated the question, the man remained silent. Kano took out a pair of handcuffs and reached for the suspect's wrist, took out his phone and checked it, checked in with Sasayama. Took his phone, checked in with Sasayama. I'm probably gonna arrest him. If I arrest him, I'm gonna be, probably gonna get a bad ending, but it's okay. I got a suspect in custody, he said. How's your end? So Sam I hesitated. He uh, got away from me. What about the Atashi case? I'm sorry, but he still gotta be around here somewhere. I'm gonna look around some more. So Sam I hung up and Kano slipped his phone back in his pocket. And as he did, the man pulled a knife from his breast and pocket and swung it right at Kano's face. Kano managed to jerk away in time, but his momentum carried him too far backward and he sprawled onto the pavement. Damn! The suspect was already making a run for it. <laughs> Suddenly a large car of foreign make a blazer. Uh Ford. That's a Chevy. It's a Chevy Blazer. Uh makes skid skid to a halt, blocking up the man's escape route. A tall Caucasian man jumped out, he rose some glasses and a crisp suit. Now corner the fleeing suspect brandished his knife. Be careful! But Kano didn't even time to finish his story, shot finish shouting his warning. There was a metallic poing and the knife went flying to the air. The man in the sunglasses had snapped his right foot up, sending the weapon of flying. As the attacker job dropped in at astonishment, the newcomer proceeded to elbow him right in the face. The blow connected and the suspect went down hard. Ah, uh, ow. The fallen man turned his head to look at Kano. His mouth moved as if he was attempting to say something. He never got it out, the man in the sunglasses kicked in the face. With a groan, the perp slumped down unconscious. Hey, Kano, what the hell are you doing? He stormed over to the man with the sunglasses. The man nonchalantly dusted off his suit. You were ordered to watch and see where these guys went, right? He spoke in fluent Japanese. Imagine that you are a Japanese person who have never been in a situation where you suddenly had to speak to a foreigner. You haven't used English in ages. Your attention grows. You think back to English class in school, but nothing you remember is helpful. You muster up the courage to spoke up, choke up a standard. Do you? Do you? 
the foreigner responds fluently in, in your own language. Nihongo de daijoubu desu. It's all right. I speak Japanese. Nihongo de What happened to that Japanese sense of honor I've heard so much about? Who? Who are you? I'm from the U.S. Embassy, Regional Security Office, the man replied. An embassy is where the embassy is. All right, all right. I know what the U.S. Embassy is. He presented Kano with his idea. Diplomatic identification card. Jack Stanley, Regional of Security Office, Security Assistance Officer. Um, sir? Your uh, your ID is expired because uh, it says expiration date December thirty first two thousand and nine. Ambassador signature John Hancock, Jack Stanley. His title is listed as security assistance officer. Cano glanced at the car he'd shown up in. The license plate was blue with white lettering, but it's, it's, it's a Japanese plate. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but the Ministry wouldn't send people diplomat. But the Ministry wouldn't just send some diplomat to intervene in the police investigation. What's your name, Detective? Stanley asked. Kano, from the Shibuya Precinct. All right, Kano. I'm going to need you to follow my instruction for the next while. Why is that? Instead of answering, Stanley took out his cell phone and make a quick call. Uh, after a few moments, he held the phone out for Kano. There. Permission from your boss, he said. What? Kano squawked. He took the phone gingerly, bracing himself. Uh, Kano speaking. You, imbecile! What the hell are you taking? It was Kuze, and he was furious. Understandably so, really. Kano has disappeared, direct order, and, and for what? All he accomplished was losing track of the Atashi case. I'm sorry, sir. You really think sorry is gonna cut it? You're off the force, Kano! Kano slumped, defeated, he had no reply. He knew he deserved whatever punishment he got. Still orders from up up Still orders from up top didn't trump the hostage's safety. If he could have gone back and done it all again, he was sure he would make the same call. Maybe that meant he wasn't detective material, but so be it. That's what I want to tell you, Kuzi continued. But for now, I need you to follow the instruction of the guy there, Stanley. Do whatever he tells you. Sir? Kano hadn't seen that one coming. He disobeyed orders that were undeniable. And yes, he knew he deserved a reprimand. But being ordered to tag along with some stranger who just turned out of the blue? What the heck? Uh, may I ask why the US Embassy is involved with this? No more question, Kano. Step in line. Please, just hold on. Sir, I have no idea what's going on here. Please, hold on. Kuzi let, let out an exasperated sigh. <sighs> that makes two of us, kid. And with that, the director hung up. It sounded like even Kuzi didn't have the whole story here. Which meant that orders were coming from someplace higher. A foreign syndicate moving the ransom around. The US Embassy. Whatever was going on, it was more than just a local kidnapping case, and Kano was deep in the middle of it. Of it. He handed the phone back to Stanley. A few moments later, two detectives from MPD arrived at the scene. Stanley headed over the fallen criminal to them. You're chasing a bu you're chasing a bomb lead, you know, Stanley said as he watched them carry the man away. What do you mean? I mean. This kidnapping isn't about the money. My priority is the girl's safety. Right now, your priority is doing what I tell you to do. Kano gave him a scowl, but Stanley ignored it. That guy we just uh, arrested, he asked. He tell you anything? No, nothing, Kano said. Really now? All trace of emotion drained from Stanley's eyes. His gaze pierced Kano like icy daggers. It held a glimmer of something dangerous. Something Kano has been seen plenty of times since he joined the force. He wasn't looking into the eyes of some diplomat diplomatic liaison. No. This was a man who knew how to kill. 
who had killed people before. With some effort, Kano managed to regather his sense of professionalism. He didn't tell me anything, he repeated. Ju I just know that he's a member of some foreign crime syndicate that works out of Shibuya. Probably knows some of their hangouts. Show me, Detective uh, Stanley said, cool as an automaton. We'll take my car. Kano wiped away some sweat that had beaded it on his brow as they headed for the vehicle. He was just sliding into the passenger seat when Kuzi radioed over the wireless. Okie dokie folks, listen up. The childish tone was back in his voice full force. Kano stiffened on reflex. Stiffened on reflex, he knew what, what, what that meant. So, uh, Itomi Osawa has, like, gone missing. What? Kano couldn't believe his ears. Wasn't Tateno supposed to be protecting her right now? Also, um, Detective Tateno hasn't radioed in. And, like, we can't reach him for our, from our end either. No way. Am I gonna put a game on my stream panel? I mean, uh, yes, um... Didn't it show? Oh, wait. I, I, I'm pretty sure I did. Thank you for coming in. I'm pretty sure I did. Alright. Because, uh, this, uh, this game is hard to tag, actually. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the tag I put was valid. Because this game is like, it's called uh, 428 Shibuya Scramble. It's, um, it's, a vi it, it's a visual novel. It looks awfully like, um, uh, 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 what's your, you call it? Uh, one of those uh, photo novel. Like, those are like real people. There's like sound effect and, and stuff like that. And uh, it's like a police drama. There's five different stories and they're intertwined with each other. Like, we follow five sub story but it's basically about a, a kidnapping and ransom money and the, the girl is with someone else yes yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting and pretty niche it's from the guy it's from uh, Spike Chomsoft and Extraction Games uh, Studios so it's uh, the same guys that brought you Danganronpa for some reason it's not the same authors but the same publishers like uh, the game was on sale so I decided to uh, play it on um, like it's it's uh, the story it's like every chapter is an hour it's like 24 like the closest description I can think uh, uh, of is like this is 24 <laughs> uh, detective Tatano is ready in oh wait it can't be um, so yeah Kuzi continued he might have gotten caught up in this uh, in this incident too it wasn't like a detective of Tateno statures to go incommunicado during an investigation. Whoops. It could only mean that something had happened to him, something major. To be continued! Well, well, well. Here's a thing from the next episode. So we finished the 12 hour mark. Woo! I would do anything, whatever it took. That was sarcasm, wasn't it? Time's up! I'll pay you double of what they're worth. What? Any evidence has been covered up. There you go. Alright, you said at your